Good morning and welcome to the 12th annual Leeds Grenville Economic Development Summit. In past, we have been weather warriors getting to this summit. That is not the case today. Hopefully you're relaxing at the kitchen table or at with a hot tea or coffee, got my big one for today, or at home or your work office. Dare I say some of you might be out on the patio or the porch today with that lovely balmy 13 degree weather we're hoping for today. Wherever you are, I am so glad you are able to join us. My name is Ann Weir. I'm the Economic Development Manager for the United Counties of Leeds and Grenville and your MC for today. Last year, we did a few things digitally and this year, here we are fully digital and coming to you virtually. Wow, it's amazing how quickly we can adapt. Congratulations to you all for making this transition so quickly. Again, we have brought political and business leaders together and I continue to be humbled and honored to serve as your economic development manager. For the past 12 years, County's economic development has presented the summit but could not be done without the partner's support. A special thank you to Heather Lawless, Grenville CFDC, Tom Russell, Thousand Island CDC, Tina C. Stevens, Valley Heartland CFDC, Rob Nolan from the City of Brockville, Amanda Tadford, Town of Gananoque, Dana Valentine from the Town of Prescott, Frank O'Hearn from the Thousand Islands Region Workforce Development Board, and a special thank you to our MP Michael Barrett and MPP Steve Clark. They have such busy schedules yet still able to help us with the planning of this event. For those of you tweeting today, please use the hashtag, and it'll come up on your screen later, hashtag LGFDev2020. Without further ado, let's get into today's agenda. Our Member of Parliament for Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes, Michael Barrett, has welcomed his fifth child on Wednesday and has provided us with this welcome. Hello, everyone. It's great that you could attend the Economic Development Summit for 2020. As you're a member of parliament for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes, I'm pleased to welcome you to this outstanding annual event. A lot of hard work goes into organizing, so I wanna give a shout out and thank you to Ann Weir, Deanna Clark, and all the Leeds, Grenville County staff for pulling this summit together. I'd also like to thank keynote speaker, the Honorable Vic Fideli, and guest speaker, Dr. Trevin Stratton, for bringing their expertise and insight to this event. 2020 will go down in the books as being a challenge, but also as a year highlighting how we are able to use technology and innovation to come together and continue building our communities and supporting economic development. All the best as we move forward, and I look forward to when we can meet next, whether virtually or in person. I certainly wish Michael and his wife Amanda much joy and happiness in this special time on the arrival of their new baby boy, Nathan. I'd next like to call upon our member of Provincial Parliament for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes, the Honourable Steve Clark, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, who is joining us here on set. Steve? Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Anne. It's an honor uh, to uh, be here. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, MP Barrett and Amanda on uh, the birth of Nathan. I'm sorry uh, that, uh, that, I, that you didn't include uh, Stephen as a, as a possible name choice, but I, I won't hold that against you, my friend. I also want to join in, in Michael in thanking Anne and uh, not just the, the entire uh, Leeds Grenville Economic Development Team, but also the United Counties of Leeds and Grenville and all uh, the CFDCs and our economic development partners uh, for the work that they've done uh, to organize uh, this conference. The, the Leeds Grenville Economic Development Department has done just such a tremendous job uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, and I wanna thank them for their work in bringing this uh, conference uh, virtually. Uh, you know, as we continue to grapple with the second wave of COVID-19 and work towards our economic recovery, it's more important than ever that, uh, that we work together uh, for today's summit, even though uh, we might be accessing it uh, apart today and virtually. Uh, because there's so many economic development and uh, municipal departments and municipal staff with us today, I wanna take a moment to highlight their efforts over the last eight months. You've all had to pivot from your usual roles 
uh, due to the response uh, of this unprecedented situation. And in doing so, you've been an, an even more invaluable resource to your communities. You've helped source PPE. You've helped to navigate government programs, health and safety products and protocols. You've had to work uh, to develop new marketing tools to help our local businesses sell their goods and services. And in the process, you've developed new relationships and strengthened our communities in ways that will benefit not just ourselves, but the world in so many ways. So I, I, wanna, I wanna thank you. COVID-19 has forced us to innovate and to do things differently. And it's caused us to focus on the basics like health and safety. But like we always do in Eastern Ontario, when a challenge presents itself, we always roll up our sleeves and become part of the solution. And that's why I'm so proud of the role that I and our government played to make uh, 3M's N95 mass plant in Rockville a reality. And how the Ontario Together Fund is supporting Greenfield Global's efforts uh, and their expansion in Johnstown to produce medical grade alcohol for hand sanitizers. And I'm excited today to have my uh, good friend and uh, cabinet colleague, uh, the Honorable Vic Fidelli, Ontario's Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, uh, to talk to us this morning about not just those investments in our riding, but the investments that our government is making to lead the recovery uh, because of COVID-19. As a government, we've always invested heavily uh, in uh, what matters most to us, including the recent announcements I made last week for local long-term care expansion projects, for health care, uh, for mental health spending, along with the funding that my ministry provided to our most vulnerable to, from the Social Services Relief Fund. Nowhere is that cooperation between governments more critical in than the, the very important issue that we'll hear later today about expanding broadband to become faster and to become more reliable in rural and remote parts of Eastern Ontario. We knew that this was an issue before COVID-19 and our government made major steps with supporting the Eastern Ontario Regional Network with a $71 million commitment. It was a commitment we've made in the summer uh, of 2018 and I was glad we were able to deliver on it early. We followed that up with a $315 million investment earlier this year to support uh, shovel-ready projects in underserved areas. And the pandemic exposed the, the need for urgent uh, help to support people who were working from home, uh, to support students that were providing remote, uh, using remote learning, and for businesses to be able to promote their services uh, to the world. Insufficient broadband stands as our biggest structural barrier to future economic growth. And that's why I was so excited to see our government's recent budget, which I believe is a game changer to provide, in addition to the dollars that I mentioned earlier, an additional $680 million uh, as a commitment to, to us uh, as a government for uh, expanded broadband and cellular access. And now, you know, we, we need to have the federal government to join us as they have on so many other projects. Uh, I think this is again, a big game changer between all three levels of government. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that moving forward. Again, I, I just wanna take this opportunity to thank you all uh, for participating in our 12th summit virtually. Uh, my door is always open to you virtually uh, under the circumstances. Um, just again, thank you for participating. I'll, uh, I'll see you again later this morning when I introduce my good friend, Vic Fidelli. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. You have absolutely been instrumental in going back to bat for Leeds Granville at the legislator, legislative. Many of the funds into this region for businesses and municipalities can be attributed to the hard work you have done. And congratulations, you should be very proud. It is indeed an honor to be a part of Leeds Granville at this time. Next, I would like to call upon Warden Pat Sayo to bring formal greetings from the United Counties of Leeds and Granville. Warden Sayo. Well, thank you very much, Anne. And uh, I, I just want to start, of course, by uh, congratulating uh, Michael uh, Barrett and Amanda on the arrival of their fifth, safe arrival of their fifth child. And uh, uh, Michael, I'm still looking for my cigar. 
Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I do have a little, a few notes here, but uh, before I start, I just want to uh, recognize and thank uh, the United Counties uh, staff here for the work that they've done organizing uh, this morning's virtual conference. Uh, on behalf of the United Counties of Leeds and Grenville, I would like to officially welcome you to the 12th annual Leeds Grenville Economic Development Summit and our first virtual format. It's so encouraging for me to see the continued support for this event, even when we can't meet in person this year. Uh, business and political leaders from across the counties and our neighbors in Eastern Ontario and the United States are joining us again. Welcome and thank you for making time in your schedule. For this year's summit, we asked key speakers to join us to provide the most up-to-date information from a national, provincial, and local perspective. This year, as in the past, we have an excellent uh, representation from all levels of government, including MP Barrett and the Honorable Steve Clark, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and our MPP uh, for um, uh, Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lake. So welcome to those uh, gentlemen. I'm glad to see you back again. And. Uh, Today, we have the following mayors joining us from the county's council and our partner municipalities. And I'm sorry if I miss a few, but I think we have Mayor Brant Burrell from the township of Elizabethtown Kitley, Mayor Roger Haley from the township of uh, Front of Young, and uh, Mayor Haley is, of course, warden elect and will take over as warden on, uh, I believe it's the 17th of December. Uh, Mayor Karina Smith uh, Gatke from the Township of Leeds in the Thousand Islands. Uh, Mayor Doug Struthers uh, from the village of uh, Merrickville Welford. Uh, Mayor Nancy Peckford from the municipality of North Grenville. And Mayor Arnie, Ari Hoganboom uh, from the Township of Rideau Lakes. And from our partner municipalities, we have Mayor Ted Loiko uh, from the town of Gananoque. Now, some of the other mayors may have joined us and um, uh, if you have, I apologize, I don't have your names in front of me here just now. Uh, but I do know that some have asked to express regrets. Uh, Mayor Her Herb Scott from the town of Ship of Athens, Mayor Doug Malanka from the township of Augusta, uh, Mayor Sean Panko from the town of Smith Falls, uh, Mayor Brett Todd from the town of Prescott, and Mayor Jason Baker from the city of Brockville. And some of them, uh, although they've expressed regrets, may have been able to uh, clear their schedules and be with us this morning. As warden, I'm honored to represent the counties at the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus. With the impact of COVID-19, the caucus has reframed their priorities to focus on long-term care, economic recovery, municipal recovery, and the Eastern Ontario Regional Network Broadband. Connectivity has been critical for the region and funding for the cellular network improvement project and the broadband gap strategy was secured and implementation is moving forward. My apologies for a second. The gigabyte project that would bring one gigabyte uh, per second up and down is gaining uh, and for up to 95% of the homes and businesses across the entire Eastern Ontario region is gaining strong support. Lisa Severson from Eorn is one of your speakers later this morning and she will provide a more comprehensive review on the strategy going forward. Locally at County's Council, it has been a year of securing funding for two of the largest projects that this has ever been, that have ever been undertaken in county's history. First is the expansion of County Road 43. This is a $35 million project and investment that will support the continued residential and business growth in the municipality of North Grenville. And I know that Mayor Peckford has been pushing for this project since first elected uh, two years ago. The County Road 43 uh, project will expand two lanes to four and include roundabouts and bridge rehabilitation. It's a very comprehensive project. The second project is the Maple View Lodge project. This $600, $600 million investment will see an increase of 132 new long-term care beds 
while the existing 60 beds will be redeveloped. As we go through the second wave of COVID, I would like to thank and acknowledge the many frontline workers throughout the region and county staff who have given of themselves in providing long-term care and supporting emergency shelters, mobile testing and paramedicine throughout the, throughout the pandemic. I would like to thank the business support working group that came together quickly in March to form a strong collaborative environment uh, supporting our business community. This included 14 municipalities, six chambers of commerce, three employment agencies, uh, both small business enterprise centers and the BIAs, plus many other provincial and federal ministries. Today is about continuing to maintain a strong economy and strong businesses in Eastern Ontario and the United Counties of Leeds and Granville. I would like to thank businesses of all sizes and sectors for your passion and resiliency to continue evolving your business in this region. As political, as political leaders, we will continue to seek out as many resources as possible to support you. And I wanna just deviate from my notes for a minute by recognizing the tremendous work our business leaders have, uh, have done in being able to keep their major businesses functioning throughout the pandemic. They've been very aware of the needs of their staff. They've provided all of the PPE that their staffs required. And thankfully, all of our major businesses are continued, have continued to function. Collaboration amongst our communities and businesses is absolutely critical now more than ever. I encourage everyone to participate in the afternoon chat sessions on the regional economic recovery priorities. Your input is important as we move forward. The summit is an event where normally everyone would come together in person, providing an amazing opportunity for a networking day. Today, the chat rooms will be this opportunity to share our best practices and thoughts on next steps moving forward in our regional economy. In closing, thank you to all of today's speakers who are giving of their time and to everyone for joining us. And once again, my thanks to our staff at the Economic Development Department for arranging this virtual summit this year. We hope to see you all in person at the Kempful Summit next year. Thank you very much. Pat, thanks so much for the past two years of your dedication as warden for the counties and for being relentless in getting the funds for to support these major projects, bringing community growth and new jobs to the region. This year's counties also partnered with mylocalmarkets.ca based in Kempville to support Leeds Granville area food producers. Speakers will be receiving a customized Leeds Granville local food package to enjoy. This is our part of trying to support our local food producers. Finally, I would like to quickly acknowledge the Leeds Grenville Economic Development Team in pulling this together. Joanne Pohl, who's actually off to my left right now. She's the Administrator and Communications Support who's doing all the logistics and bringing the questions to us together uh, and also did your registration and participant list so much. Deanna Clark, also uh, Economic Development Officer, coordinates all of our media, the Bill Fake Award uh, and our media connections for this. Jim Hutton, a business development officer who just returned on Monday as Shelby McFarland has headed back on maternity leave for her second child. We're still waiting news on that, but uh, keeping our fingers crossed for a safe arrival there as well. Um, so, well, let's get to today's speakers. It gives me great pleasure uh, to have Dr. Trevin Stratton join us, Chief Economist and Vice President for the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. You will find Trevin's bio in the speaker page at investagain, bestleadsgranville.com slash uh, summit 2020. Prior to his position at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, Trevin is no stranger to Leeds and Grenville. In fact, he had been instrumental in providing key reports and plans throughout the region, some of which I'll talk later. Trevin, welcome. 
No, thanks, Anne, and uh, thanks for the kind introduction. And it's uh, it's a pleasure to be invited to to this event as well. Um, as Anne mentioned, uh, you know, I have a, a long history of, of economic development in the Leeds Grenville region. Uh, you know, including um, being somewhat involved in the Labote project and, and a tourism economic impact assessment, um, also with the rejuvenation of Kempville College. Um, so it's great to be invited, um, and thanks, Anne, for that. Um, you know, it's it's great to work together with you again in this way too. You're you're one of the best economic developers. I've ever worked with uh, all across Canada. Um, but of course, I'm, I'm no longer in the economic development space. Uh, I'm now at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Um, and for those of you that, that may not know, uh, the Canadian Chamber is, in essence, the, the voice of business in Canada. Um, so we represent a network of around 200,000 businesses across the country um, from every sector of the economy, every region of the country, um, all sizes of business as well, from some of Canada's largest corporations or some of the world's largest corporations, um, all the way down to individual one-person small businesses too. Um, and so that's kind of the, the perspective that we take when uh, when we work together with governments or with economic developers and, and trying to get policies put in place for, for growth and job creation. Uh, what I've been asked to do today is to give you a, um, a brief outline of the state of the economy, um, you know, in the span of about 30 minutes uh, globally and, um, and what's taking place in Canada in, in the middle of the largest economic downturn in almost a century. Um, so for the sake of time, maybe we can uh, get right to it. Um, so Ben, if you can go to the next slide. Perfect. So here we have, um, you know, the growth projections in uh, in Canada or around the world, um, and you can see that there's a bit of a divide um, taking place as well. Uh, you know, certainly when it comes to um, the developing countries or emerging markets, um, you know, we're seeing a bit of a less of an impact there. But when we're talking about advanced industrialized economies like ourselves in Canada or the United States or the EU or Australia, um, we're seeing these countries actually taking uh, much more of the hit economically um, when, we're still, when we're talking about the global economy. Um, you know, certainly in terms of what's taking place this year, um, but also looking ahead to next year as well. Uh, you know, we're seeing that the actual recovery period is going to be much faster or that, once again, those emerging markets are going to be driving uh, global economic recovery into the future as well. Um, and so this is certainly important to, to take into account, obviously, when, when it just comes to the state of the economy, but specifically for economic developers, um, also when it comes to investment attraction. Um, if you're looking for FDI coming into the country, um, the growth rates in Canada, though they will be high next year, and I'll show that in a second, um, you know, you're going to be competing against some, some other countries uh, around the world um, that, that might be starting economic recovery at a, um, uh, already, um, even if we're looking at China, and I'll show you that in a second, they've already started their economic recovery and their economy is actually growing this year um, compared to ourselves and, and many other countries whose, whose economy is, has contracted this year. Um, but, but And so this is just a very important um, aspect to keep in mind when, when it comes to economic recovery next year globally. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, and so here we have it broken down by region as well. Um, and so if you look at the different kind of uh, continents or, or regions of the economy, um, you'll also see that, that some regions are much harder hit than others. Um, certainly when it comes to Europe and when it comes to Latin America and the Caribbean, um, you know, we're seeing quite a big hit in some of those economies as, as the EU enters a second wave in many countries right now. Um, certainly there's been a, a very big hit on top of, of what they're dealing with with Brexit at, at the end of this year too. Um, if we're looking at Latin America, um, the numbers in Brazil, which is obviously the largest economy in the region too, uh, the COVID numbers are, are not very good. Um, they, they're one of the worst performing countries when it comes to, to flattening the curve. Um, and so this is having a, a huge impact on, on their economies. Um, well, if we look at um, East Asia, Southeast Asia, um, you know, they're actually seeing the lowest or the smallest economic impact this year um, of, of any region. Um, and also when we're looking forward to, to next year, that's probably where we'll see the most growth coming out of economic recovery as well. Uh, and if you go to the next slide. Uh, and so here we have the, the latest World Economic Outlook projections as well. Um, and so you'll certainly see um, Canada is, um, you know, we're not doing the worst and, and we're not doing the best. We're kind of middle of the road when it comes to advanced economies. Um, but if you look at, you know, we're obviously seeing a significant economic decline this year, um, you know, around around 7%. 
Um, and this is, you know, co comparable to to other advanced industrialized economies right in the middle. Um, you know, we're not dealing with what uh, Italy or Spain are dealing with. Um, obviously, they have very significant tourism sectors, and so they're they're being hit um, in particular because of that. Um, but we're also, you know, we're doing worse in terms of economic decline uh, when it comes to the advanced economies average, or, or if we're looking at, at the United States, um, our largest trading partner, um, and also a competitor when it comes to investment traction. Well, if we look at the um, the numbers on the right, um, if we're looking at emerging markets and developing economies, um, you'll see, as I mentioned, that China's actually growing this year already. Um, you know, they've gotten their COVID numbers under control, their economy has started to open up and it hasn't had to close again, or at least not, not in a significant way. Um, so China's actually still seeing 2% GDP growth this year. Um, and looking ahead to next year might might be over 8% GDP growth, um, which is actually higher than, than China was projected to um, grow this year prior to COVID happening. Um, but similarly, you know, you'll see a, a a big economic hit in India, for instance. But then next year, they're they're really driving growth too, um, and so the growth rates next year in a lot of these countries are going to be uh, much higher than than what we're seeing in Canada and other advanced industrial economies too. So if we could go to the next slide. Specifically, if you want to zero in on what's happening in the U.S., uh, you know, we're seeing, uh, and, and we're seeing this in Canada too, which I'll show you in a second, um, but we're seeing a divide in terms of where the recovery is happening um, and how it's uneven across sectors as well. Um, and so you'll see the decline in a lot of ways is really taking place um, in the service sector um, in the United States and in Canada. Um, and obviously there are different types of services. We're not necessarily talking about financial services or, or insurance here. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, restaurants, we're talking about hotels, we're talking about tourism, you know, these types of sectors that are in the service industry. Um, and so you'll see, you know, when it comes to private employment, uh, but also when it comes to consumption, pe what people are consuming, um, that in high contact services, Services, that's where the biggest hit is taking place, um, but the hit is still taking place in low contact services as well. Um, when it comes to the goods producing industry, we're actually seeing consumption uh, having increased um, in that. And so those sectors have been able to recover um, or at least have been able to adapt to the new COVID world um, because they don't require uh, as much physical presence. Um, and so they've been able to use technology in a different way as well. Um, but the employment hasn't still returned to that sector in the US either. So if we can go to the next slide, just two. Um, obviously, this is um, very important for Canada, considering the size of the energy industry um, in our economy. Um, but you'll see that um, oil and gas, uh, the oil price recovery, global oil prices, um, hasn't recovered at the same pace as other natural resources has have. You know, if we're looking at base metals, if we're looking at agricultural products, if we're looking at forestry products, they also took a hit just like oil. But they have actually recovered um, to above what their index was, uh, you know, on, on January 1st. Um, while oil and gas, um, you know, has has recovered a little bit, but it still hasn't returned to to that level. Um, and so obviously this is having a, a specific impact on Canada, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but also when it comes to global economic recovery, and we're looking at some of the regions that um, might have very strong energy sectors, the Middle East, for instance, uh, you know, this is how having a putting downward pressure on their economies on their economic recovery as well. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, and similarly, what we're seeing during the pandemic, and this might, the pandemic might have not been the catalyst for this, but it certainly accelerated it, um, is that we've seen, you know, for many decades, we saw globalization and increase in global trade, um, an increase in global capital flows, um, certainly very important for economic developers when it comes to foreign direct investment. Um, we've seen a reversal of that. Um, and, you know, some people might say that this even started in 2008 with the previous financial crisis. Um, some people might say that it started in 2016 with, with tariffs being put in place or, or with Brexit uh, as well. Um, but we've certainly seen an acceleration of this process of deglobalization, for, for lack of a better term, during the pandemic. Um, so we've seen a lot of businesses move towards, uh, you know, more national, local, or regional supply chains um, instead of global supply chains. Um, and this has had, had a big impact on, on the global supply chains that we've created internationally and, and globally over the past few decades. Um, and it hasn't come back to that level yet. And so a big question is, uh, you know, whether these moves toward nearshoring, onshoring, uh, whether they're permanent or, or just temporary temporary during the pandemic, and then they'll go back to normal uh, once the vaccine is created and disseminated, uh, hopefully next year. 
if we can go to the next slide, here we go. Um, and so to specifically um, zero in on Canada. Um, so this data is from uh, the latest Bank of Canada's monetary policy report, their latest um, economic projections for the country. Um, and so this differs quite a bit from their previous projections. Um, and so it differs in, in two different ways. Their previous projections were done in July. These, these were done uh, just, just a few weeks ago. Um, and so, first of all, the economic hit to Canada's economy, our GDP decline, um, is actually going to be less than was initially thought in July. Um, so the initial hit to Canada's economy um, is not going to be as big as we at first thought. Uh, you know, when we were dealing with the first wave. Um, and so that's somewhat positive news. Um, you know, we're, we're taking a bit of a lesser hit right now. Um, but then that's combined with, with a difference in projections is that our economic recovery is going to be much more prolonged than was initially thought to. Um, so the Bank of Canada's initial projections did not take into account a, a second wave or, or it said it was a risk, but those weren't involved in their actual numbers and projections. Um, now, you know, clearly in, in many parts of this country, we're, we're right in the middle of a second wave. Um, and so this means that our actual economic recovery is going to be much longer than, than was initially thought. Um, so for the projections, um, our economy, national economy, it's not supposed to get back to its pre-pandemic size in, in terms of GDP uh, until early in 2022. Uh, in terms of uh, economic production, um, we're not going to get back to our pre-pandemic size of economy until later in 2022. Uh, and certainly uh, the Governor of the Bank of Canada, Tiff Macklem, signaled that interest rates are going to remain at their current historical lows, 0.25, uh, until at least 2023 as well. Um, and so, you know, this is this is really the long term economic recovery um, that we're looking at. That's not to say that our recovery won't start. Um, you know, it's it's already started in in some cases. Uh, you know, our our economy has been growing over the past few months. Though so we'll see what happens with the second wave now, um, but it won't actually get back to the level that it used to be for quite some time. Um, and similarly, um, uh, you'll see in this graph too, um, the drivers of growth um, are changing as well. It's okay, you can go to the next graph. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so it's, uh, you know, we're seeing a huge decline in consumption right now. Uh, particularly, you know, Canadians just don't even have the opportunity to spend on the same things that they used to spend on. But even apart from that, you know, obviously with a lot of the economic uncertainty that's involved right now um, and, and job uncertainty too, um, a lot of Canadians are, are saving money instead of spending it, uh, which makes a lot of sense in, in terms of, of, of why they might be preparing for that uncertainty. Um, or they're using, uh, you know, any money that they're getting to, to pay off debt, but, but not necessarily to consume. Um, and so that's a, that's a big hit on, on our economic activity this year as well. Um, you'll see that business investment is also way down. Um, and prior to the pandemic, Canadian business investment wasn't great in the first place. It was rather anemic for, for the past few years. Um, but we're seeing a big hit on that right now, too. A lot of businesses are sitting on their wallets because of a lot of the uncertainty that we're seeing in the economy, too, right now. Um, or, you know, they're, they're putting um, much of their cash towards uh, remaining in operation or, or paying off their debts um, as opposed to investing in growth, um, which, which makes sense, of course, right now, too. Um, but as we look ahead to next year in that 2021 column, uh, you know, you'll see, we see consumption uh, increasing. We'll see government spending obviously increasing by, um, you know, historical amounts right now. Um, and, you know, this is good news because there's going to be growth in the economy, but the drivers of growth are somewhat concerning, right? Um, it's consumption, it's housing, it's government spending. Um, it's not necessarily business investment um, that is driving growth. We, you know, we, we won't even see that. If you look at the next two years, 2021 and 2022, the business investment that we'll see or that's projected won't even make up for what is lost this year um, and that's really why why we're advocating for to put in place those types of policies that will encourage a business-led uh, recovery and, and private investment coming out of this as well uh, and so if we can go to the next slide so here we have it, um, you know, when it comes to business investment broken down uh, by regions as well. And, and you know, we're seeing uh, across the board declines in business investment, uh, both both this year and, and, and also, you know, in terms of the hit next year. Uh, but specifically within Canada, a lot of investment in this country um, is in the energy sector. Uh, and that is one of the sectors that is being doubly hit right now, you know, apart from what all businesses are dealing with when it comes to COVID. Um, and the energy sector does require physical presence for, for a lot of their activities too. Um, they're also dealing with, with just lower oil prices right now. Um, and so we're seeing a significant hit to business investment in that sector, which impacts business investment as a whole in Canada, um, since the energy sector takes up so much business investment in this country. 
Um, and if you can go to the next slide too. Uh, and so here we see Canadian exports as well. Um, this has to do with that kind of process of deglobalization that I was talking about as well. Um, certainly, you know, there is a wild card um, in play, obviously, with a potential change in U.S. administration. Some of the issues we saw with our largest trading partner uh, with USMCA and with tariffs on steel and aluminum, um, we, we might uh, have be able to alleviate that pressure when it comes to exports with our largest trading partner. Um, though, I, you know, I, I don't think that we should assume that a Joe Biden administration will necessarily be less protectionist than, than a Trump administration either. Um, certainly Joe Biden's economic plan is, is called Made in America. Um, and so, you know, there's there's definitely going to be a push towards um, producing in America as opposed to, to importing Canadian parts for, for manufacturing or different Canadian products too. Um, and so this is certainly going to, going to have placed some downward pressure on our economy and the opportunities for Canadian businesses to export globally. If we go to the next slide. Um, so one of the sectors that has been able to rebound um, is certainly housing. Um, housing is actually above what it was pre-pandemic um, already at this point. Uh, certainly this has to do with some pent up demand. You know, a lot of people are unable to move or buy homes um, for a few months back there in March, April uh, and May in some cases as well. Um, but a lot of it, um, you know, also has to do with people looking to put their money um, in, in safe assets, not necessarily knowing what's going on with the uncertainty in the economy. People also valuing their houses more than they used to be, which increases demand because a lot more people are at home or at home for a lot more time than they used to be too. Um, and so we're actually seeing what's interesting uh, is is uh, the real estate markets that are heating up are, are in some ways non-traditional ones too. It's not necessarily the Toronto's and Vancouver's that, that we're seeing, but it's a lot of other real estate markets right now too, um, as people are able to work remotely and don't necessarily have to live in downtown Toronto or live in downtown Vancouver um, to, to be able to, uh, to, to go to their office with a short commute or anything like that. Uh, so if we go to the next slide as well. Um, and this is what economists like me are calling a, um, a K-shaped recovery. And so I showed you that information about the U.S. when it comes to the service sector versus the goods producing sector. Um, and we're seeing this in Canada, too. Um, and so, you know, a, a lot of economists talked about a V-shaped recovery where there would be a steep decline, but also a steep recovery or a U-shaped recovery where it would be a slower decline and a slower economic recovery. Um, if we're talking about a K-shaped recovery, um, what we're talking about is that some sectors have been able to recover those sectors that don't necessarily require physical presence for their business models to work. And so those sectors are on the top half of the K and they've been able to go up. Um, after after the economy reopened. Um, while on the bottom side of the K, we have a number of sectors that are still hurting and that haven't been able to recover at the same level and that now are facing increased restrictions as well in many parts of the country, once again, with a second wave. Um, and so that has to do with, you know, accommodation, food services, arts and entertainment, tourism, um, you know, those businesses that really require people to be there in a lot of ways for, for their models to work. Um, and so that's what we're seeing. We're, we're seeing almost a divide um, in the economy between those sectors that can recover and those sectors that, that have just not been able to and that are in it maybe a bit more for the long haul when it comes to the economic hit that they're going to have to take. Uh, and so if we could go to the next slide. And that's the same with consumption patterns as well. Um, if we're looking at, you know, what Canadians are actually spending their money on, uh, you know, you'll see that shelter housing, uh, you know, is, is basically a flat line. So it hasn't gone down that much um, and, and, and people are still spending on that. Um, when it comes to essentials, uh, you know, people are obviously still spending on that right now too. Um, but when it comes to, you know, spending on things that are hard to physically distance, um, it's gone down and it hasn't really gone back up. Um, and it probably won't um, until, you know, fully recover on, until there's a vaccine in place. Um, and so figuring out how we can uh, preserve, you know, all of those small businesses that are in those sectors um, is going to be very important for any type of, of economic recovery strategy. So if we go to the next slide. Um, and so here we have kind of what um, what the spending changes are um, by sector two. And this is not, um, you know, I back when I used to be an academic, my research was on was on economic crises. This is not an economic crisis like any other. Um, you know, if we think about 2008, or a lot of people use the analogy of 1929, you know, these huge economic downturns that, that, that we think about in history, the catalyst for those economic downturns was a financial crisis uh, that then had reverberations throughout the real economy. Um, the catalyst for this is a pandemic, not a financial crisis. Um, and so there are a lot of different factors in play. Um, and so you'll see, you know, when it came to spending changes um, in, in 2008, um, a lot of the, the decrease was in, uh, you know, durable goods, 
goods, non-durable goods, but in the goods sector. Um, what we're seeing right now is that the big economic hit is taking place in the services sector. Um, and specifically in terms of what people used to spend money on um, that you'll see in the graph on the right versus where they've decreased spending, um, it's really in those service sector industries. Um, and so this makes this almost a very unique crisis, uh, which also makes it challenging in terms of policymakers to have an economic response to it as well. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide. Um, and it's the same story when it comes to employment. Um, when we're looking at job losses, um, they're really concentrated um, in, in a lot of these sectors. At the beginning of the crisis, uh, you know, Canada lost about 3 million jobs. We've been able to claw back quite a few of those, um, but you know, we're still kind of net 750,000 jobs down and that number might increase again with the second wave. Um, but we're really seeing them concentrated, right? In uh, restaurants and food services and retail and construction to a certain extent, though they had a bit of a boon during the summer, but now that the season is over we'll see what happens with those numbers too um while other sectors you know agriculture obviously the, the demand for food is still high um when we're looking at, at utilities or you know certainly that that doesn't depend on physical presence um, and so the job losses have been much less in, in some other sectors as well so if we go to the next slide too um, and there's actually been a, a bit of a disparity when it comes to gender as well. Um, and so uh, when the initial crisis hit back in March, uh, what we saw were that the sectors that immediately shed jobs um, were the sectors in which there were more women employed than men. Um, so in some of those hardest hit sectors that I mentioned, food services, accommodation, um, there are more women working in those sectors than men. Then eventually the entire economy caught up and, and men also lost their job at the same rates as women. Um, but what's interesting is that usually in these types of economic crises, it's first in, first out. The sectors that are first hit are the sectors to also first recover. What we're seeing in this crisis is that it's really first in, last out. Um, and so men were also able to get their jobs back at a faster rate, even, even though they lost them later too. Um, and so, and then eventually uh, as the economy opened up, women were able to catch up to when it came to job recovery as men. And they're both almost at the same level now, um, though there is still risk in the economy uh, in terms of a lot uh, of women are in a more precarious uh, work situation um, and are unsure whether they'll be able to stay in the workplace. Um, and that's why there's such a, a focus at the federal and provincial levels uh, on, on child care. And I, I imagine we'll probably see an announcement on that in, in the fall economic update uh, from the federal government over the next month. If we go to the next slide too. Um, and so even though the, the job numbers have kind of caught up, if we're looking at it broken down by, by gender, um, we're seeing a huge hit demographically um, when it comes to job losses and, and recovery by age. Um, and, you know, the youngest Canadians are, are really taking, uh, you know, a huge hit right now too, um, and they haven't been able to recover. Um, and there's, there's a real risk of almost a lost generation here um, in terms of the opportunities for, for Canadians in the economy, young Canadians in the economy. Um, and even, you know, if we're looking back at June, um, when, when job numbers were, were very bad. Um, you know, I think uh, something like uh, 18 to 24 year old Canadians that were looking for summer jobs, but um, were planning to go back to school in the fall, had something like a 40% unemployment rate. Um, and so, you know, this is this is rather significant as well. So if we go to the next slide. Um, what's interesting, too, is that um, in terms of job losses um, and, and the lack of job recovery in certain sectors, um, some of those jobs tend to be uh, lower wage jobs as opposed to higher wage jobs. Um, and so we're actually seeing Canadians um, that, that are in kind of the lowest quartile of, uh, of wages um, are a lot of the Canadians that are still bearing the brunt of job losses, too. Um, and what's really interesting is that in the um, in the graph on the right, um, you'll see that black line is um, is the CERB payment, you know, how much money it was compared to you know what was the average wage for the lowest quartile. So a lot of the people that um, that have lost their jobs or that are targeted in those sectors um, were receiving CERB payments that were actually above what what their salaries were. Um, and so this is this is creating um, a bit of a, an issue in the labor market in terms of uh, in terms of being able to get Canadians back into the workforce. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, I can show you some numbers on that as well. Um, and this has to do with, um, for instance, uh, Canada spending. So Canada has actually spent the most money per size of their economy um, than any other country in the G20 uh, during the pandemic. Um, so Canada's deficit is the largest this year of any uh, G20 economy, um, spent the most versus the size of our economy. 
Um, and so this isn't, you know, certainly a lot of this spending has been needed. Um, what I think a lot of people in the business community have been pushing for is uh, much more targeted spending. Um, cause, cause certainly we can't spend forever. You know, there are limits to how much we can spend money is finite. Um, and so, uh, to have targeted spending on the aspects of our economic recovery that will have the greatest return on investment, um, is going to be very important. Um, and so to use that CERB example that, that I just mentioned, so in the second quarter of this year, about $30 billion more uh, of money went out in uh, supports to Canadians than was actually lost in salaries and wages. So certainly we, we need to support those Canadians that have lost their jobs, um, but that $30 billion extra that went out in one quarter uh, this year is also money that could have been used on uh, you know infrastructure or rural broadband or childcare. Um, and so it's important to keep this kind of return on investment aspect in mind too. We go to the next slide. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, Canadians um, that, that are receiving a lot of money um, are, they're not necessarily spending it. Um, they're putting it in their bank accounts uh, they're, uh, or, or they're using it to pay off their debt or they're, they're putting it in housing, um, but they're not, you know, spending in the same ways that they used to, obviously, because a lot of the uncertainty that we're seeing. There's a great report from CIBC that came out a couple of days ago showing how much money is actually just sitting in bank accounts, personal and business bank accounts um, that can hopefully, um, once we get to economic recovery, be able to propel uh, growth, you know, with all that that money that's sitting in the system, but that's just not going to use. Um, but that will, of course, depend on um, on people actually uh, consuming again. Uh, you know, that they'll go back to to that those older behaviors uh, once we once the vaccine is disseminated and we can get to an economic recovery period. So, if we go to the next slide as well. Uh, if we look at it broken down by province, um, certainly some provinces, all provinces and, and territories aren't doing great. Um, you know, we're all seeing an economic decline this year, but some are doing better than others. Um, certainly the Atlantic region, with the exception of Newfoundland, um, in, in part because of the Atlantic bubble that they put in place there, um, are seeing the lowest economic declines this year. Um, and their case numbers are also the, the best in Canada as well. Um, if we're looking at the worst performing provinces economically this year, um, we're looking at Newfoundland and Alberta, um, and I'm sure no shock to anyone and that's specifically because of the significant energy industries in, in those provinces as well. So apart from what everyone is dealing with when it comes to COVID, um, their economies are taking an even greater hit um, because of the decline in, in energy prices as well. So if we could go to the next slide. When it comes to economic recovery, and I'll caveat this with, um, so the previous slide was from TD, this slide is from RBC, they use different methodologies, which is why the numbers are, are a bit different, um, but it's the same story, um, which is that those, uh, provinces that were, uh, you know, take or were doing the best this year um, are probably going to grow the least next year. If we're looking at the Atlantic provinces, you know, they're kind of at the bottom of 2021 projections um, through no fault of their own. It's just that they don't have as much uh, growth to make up for because they haven't lost as much this year as well. Um, but the real provinces that are going to be propelling growth next year um, are, are the biggest provinces in the country, uh, Ontario, Quebec, BC, Alberta. Um, and so that's, that's good news in terms of driving our growth next year. And we are looking at significant, you know, over 4% growth next year um, is, is pretty significant. That's the largest growth rate Canada has, has seen in, in quite some time, uh, though, of course, it still won't even make up for what we lost this year. Um, and if we could go to the next slide. Uh, and so here we just see the story in terms of the provincial recovery timeline. Um, as I mentioned, some of those uh, Atlantic provinces are, are going to uh, recover at a greater rate. Um, this graph was actually done before Manitoba um, put in place these new restrictions earlier this week. So their projection to recover quickly uh, might be impacted by that. Um, but certainly the provinces that we're looking at that will take the longest to recover are, are Newfoundland and Alberta as well. So if we could go to the final slide. Um, so, you know, certainly when it comes to the um, state of our economy uh, or, or the global economy as well, um, you know, there are a lot of variables. It's very hard for economists to do projections in this type of environment just because it's so fluid. Um, but really what we're looking at is in some ways trying to um, bridge businesses and Canadians over to such point as we can have a vaccine. Um, and then at that point, will we only really be able to engage in, in a true economic recovery for all sectors going forward, particularly those hardest hit sectors? Um, and so in terms of projections, you know, we're, we're looking at, at a bleak winter probably for a lot of those hardest hit sectors over the next few months. Um, it's going to be really tough for those restaurants in your communities, for those hotels in your communities, for, for people in the tourism industry and, and arts and entertainment, live shows. Um, but ideally, you know, we're expecting a vaccine sometime in the spring next year. Obviously, it might take time for it to be disseminated to all Canadians too. Um, but that, you know, in the second half of next year is really when we're going to be able to start the economic recovery process going forward. 
Um, and I believe there uh, may be some questions. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, if Anne, if you'd be providing those or. Trevin, thanks. This has uh, been, uh, wow, amazing amount of information and a very crunch time, but let's try and take a couple of the questions. Uh, we've got one from Laurel Burnham Green. Uh, within the next three to five years, what are the most strategic opportunities for local chambers? And I think it just talks to a little of what you've just mentioned of uh, how do we support these, these industries that are challenged right now? Yeah, and I think there, um, you know, for economic developers, there are, you have to think about it in two ways. First of all, you have to think about it in terms of the timeline, because the next six months, you really need to focus on supporting the businesses that exist in your community and helping them survive as, as best as you can. Um, you know, that has to do with um, helping them being able to access some of the supports that are in place, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, the wage subsidy, when it comes to rent support, um, things like that. Um, a lot of small businesses, they don't have dedicated accounting departments they you know they might not have experience going through government application programs and so being able to have kind of a centralized repository of information of everything that's available to them and support on actually going through the application process um you know is uh, and, and if they're eligible for some of these supports um i think is going to be very useful for for some of those hardest hit sectors um and that should have to do with federal provincial supports there are also a lot of private sector grants that are available to these businesses to be able to survive to um at the municipal level, you know, certainly looking at uh, bylaws uh, for people being able to to dine outside, perhaps with heaters. Um, you know, looking at, at property taxes as well. You know, maybe being able to defer those can can help a number of businesses too. Um, but if we're looking, uh, you know, over the longer term, or if we're looking at some of those sectors that aren't hardest hit, that have been able to adapt in many ways using technology, um, you know, there's a big opportunity there to be able to get your retailers to, to be able to use e-commerce or to be able to use social media to be able to attract customers from even outside of your community um, and adapting in that way. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of opportunities as well for uh, for economic developers that might not be in the big urban cities, um, you know, but but that that now have new opportunities to be able to attract people to their communities um, because people are able to work remotely, to be able to attract businesses to your communities um, because businesses don't might not lead as much as large of an office footprint anymore as well, um, and they might be just just looking for for lower rents. Um, and so there are certainly some some opportunities there for economic developers over the longer term as well. Super. Um, we've got another question that came in early from Sandra Lawn. What are the ways that rural communities like Leeds and Grenville can participate in the rapidly evolving global and national circular economy that address both economic and environmental changes, climate change she mentions? Yeah, and this is going to be a, a big, a big item. And if it were to be my guess, obviously, federally, we're going to see a fall economic update. Um, probably before the holidays at some point. Um, but I imagine there's going to be a federal budget, uh, you know, next year, maybe in March, assuming that there's no election before then, since we have a minority government. Uh, I imagine the, the budget next year is going to have a huge climate change component in it. Um, and so apart from what the government is doing, I also think that um, the business community has really started to take a leadership role um, when it comes to addressing climate change, like, you know, including ESG metrics and their reporting and a number of energy companies have started to do this. Um, and also a lot of the pressure isn't even necessarily coming from government. Um, investors are looking for, for this as well um, when it comes to, to looking for projects to invest in that they want it to be um, sustainable. Uh, when it comes to the circular economy itself, um, obviously there was the plastic ban that, that was announced by the government, um, which, which is an interesting first step. I think that if we actually are going to capitalize on the opportunity for a circular economy in Canada, a lot more needs to happen. Like uh, a, a plastic ban, you, you know, uh, does, certainly has an impact, um, but we're going to need a lot of the critical infrastructure in place to make that circular going forward, right? And to actually capitalize on the positive benefits for our environment. Um, so our approach is going to have to address the significant shortfalls we have in Canada when it comes to waste facility capacity, when it comes to recycling capacity, when it comes to compostable plastics production um, and, and risk of trade challenges having to do with this as well. And so until we have that uh, infrastructure in place, um, fully capitalizing on a circular economy um, is going to be challenging. Excellent. So we'll just do one more question uh, from Michael Berry. Forecasters are suggesting supply chain will return uh, to China as key supplier. What are your thoughts as many politicians are saying we need to reshore our supply chains? 
Yeah, and it's this is one of the big questions to me, and I'm not sure that that we've actually fully grappled with it, just because because policymakers have really been been dealing with just getting the pandemic under control uh, in in many ways. But over the longer term, what's going to happen with supply chains are certainly we're seeing a bit of a reversal, right, uh, when it comes to nearshoring or potential onshoring. One of the big questions to me is first of all. Will that be national supply chains or will that be regional supply chains? It, it might not be global as it used to be, um, but that will that be, uh, for instance, North American supply chains or Canadian supply chains um, is a question to me. Um, and certainly um, also with the change in administration in the United States, um, there might be a push for more regional supply chains in North America, uh, Canada, US and Mexico, um, as well as Europe, as well as Asia having their own regional supply chains um, as opposed to just simply nationalizing supply chains. Um, another interesting angle um, that, that we should look at is whether this will apply to some sectors or all sectors or apply to sectors differently. Um, so, you know, I imagine we'll probably see this reversal um, towards nearshoring and onshoring uh, occur in uh, food production for food security. Um, we might see it in manufacturing as well, uh, also, you know, for the production of PPE and things like that. Um, but will this apply to, for instance, um, technology sectors? Uh, you know, will this apply to, to other sectors of the economy too um, is, is a big question mark that I'm not sure we know the answer to just yet. Super. Gentlemen, we could probably spend hours here chatting even more, but uh, I know uh, we appreciate, uh, thank you for this excellent presentation and the snapshot is what, what is happening out there. It was very valuable as we go into our afternoon of uh, trying to figure out from a regional perspective, what are priorities and where we focus. Um, so thank you. Uh, you'll be receiving a Leeds Grenville custom uh, local food package because uh, we're trying to support our food producers as much as, problem, as possible. Uh, and that'll come directly to your address. Thank you again so much. Very much appreciate your presentation today. Thanks, Anne, and have a great rest of your conference. Cheers. So the next portion of our agenda is the Bill Fake Economic Development Leadership Award. As part of this segment, we have produced a very special video about the award and the nominees. After the video, Warden Pat Sale will be joining us live to do the announcement. Welcome to this segment of the program. I'm Warden Pat Sale, and it's my pleasure to introduce the Bill Thake Memorial Economic Development Award on this, its 10th anniversary. During his lifetime, Bill was known for his leadership and mentoring skills. His dedication to Westport and the greater Leeds Grenville area is legendary. Bill broke many records, serving 52 consecutive years on Westport Council to set a Canada-wide record as the longest serving head of any municipality. He was warden of the United Counties for an unprecedented four terms. Those who knew him well remember his warmth and his great sense of humor. Bill's widow Marlene has joined us each and every year to help present the certificates to each of the nominees and to the winner. Marlene is proud that this award continues each year in her late husband's memory and would be here again with us this year if not for the restrictions of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now I welcome you to watch the following video on our three outstanding nominees with introductions from County CAO Andy Brown and Economic Development Officer Deanna Clark. Deanna and I are pleased to tell you a little bit about our 2020 nominees. All three nominations have been supported by their local municipal councils. Candidates are to have proven leadership skills, shown longevity in the community support, and have made a positive impact on economic development. Our first nominee is Karen Bedard from the municipality of North Grenville. Karen is a strong community leader and the founding director of the highly successful Kempville Live Music Festival. This event has helped put North Grenville and the entire region on the map. Karen and her team are already working hard on a virtual Kempville Live event for 2021. Karen is the event director leading more than 350 volunteers to have this festival come to life. Attendance at the four-day event has grown dramatically over the years. More than 24,000 music lovers attended in 2019 alone. In some of its peak years, this festival has brought in 2.1 million in visitor spending. It is an economic driver benefiting North Grenville and the greater Leeds Grenville region as a whole. 
Karen is engaged in keeping this model event alive for many, many years to come. Her dedication to her community is evident. She has served in many different roles since moving to the area with her family in 2007. She has been a Girl Guide leader, a Kempfell District Minor Hockey Association board member, a tournament coordinator, to name just a few. She has facilitated many events over the years at the North Granville Municipal Centre, including clinics and special events, as well as volunteering with the Kempfell 73's Junior Hockey Club. Congratulations, Karen, on your nomination. Our second nominee is Janet Campbell, Village of Merrickville Wolford. Janet is a dynamo when it comes to promoting her community as a world-class destination. She's the founder and owner of Mrs. McGarrigal's Fine Foods. This award-winning entrepreneur has created a cornerstone retail and manufacturing business in the heart of Merrickville that has stood the test of time. After 32 years, Janet's business continues to expand, and most recently, she added another 230 products to her online store. The store and its mustard and condiment manufacturing operations, as well as her respected cooking school, attract chefs, foodies, and visitors from local communities, city day trippers, as well as travelers from across Canada, the US, and Europe. Janet has a strong belief in the collective force of businesses working together for their community. She is quick to promote local food and area products, and has used her business to introduce other operators to her Meet the Maker series. One of her passions is mentoring new entrepreneurs. Janet has spearheaded and taken part in many community fundraisers and initiatives, including her work for juvenile diabetes and raising funds for the Beth Donovan Hospice. Most recently, Janet has been tutoring two Syrian children through the Rideau Bridge to Canada program. Along with Team Merrickville, she cycled her way to help raise $136,000 for the Ottawa Hospital and Cancer Research. Congratulations to Janet on her nomination. Our third and final nominee is Wendy Merkley from the Township of Leeds and the Thousand Islands. Wendy is a community champion who spearheads a myriad of projects and initiatives in the village of Rockport as well as across the region. Most notably, Wendy is chair of the Friends of Rockport Customs House, a volunteer group which has worked hard to raise funds and to purchase, redevelop and open an amazing riverfront property for the first time to the public. Through her efforts, the site now gives local people, as well as visitors, access to the St. Lawrence River and the Thousand Islands. Wendy led a team to rebuild the pier, raise and repair the building, keep the boat launch, and install benches and picnic tables for the public to enjoy. Wendy helped recruit and train ambassadors to run the facility to create a focal point in the village. For many years, she has been a part of the Rockport Development Group and is its current chair. Wendy and the group promote quality tourism in the village while celebrating local heritage. The group values community beautification and they have added interpretive signs and murals to make Rockport a premier destination in the Thousand Islands region. Wendy is an advocate for local business and has worked hard to address the issues of high water levels in recent years. She is the current Vice Chair of the Thousand Islands Community Development Corporation and has served on its board since 2015. Congratulations, Wendy, on your nomination. Now I would like to call on Warden Seu to announce this year's recipient. Uh, well, here we are, folks, and uh, you've heard the uh, announcement of the nominees and I've been given the uh, envelope here, and uh, let's have a look. The winner for the 2020 uh, Bill Think Memorial Economic uh, Development Leadership Award is, and there are two, Janet Campbell from the village of Merrickville Wolford and Wendy Merkley, the township of Leeds in the Thousand Islands. So congratulations to the two winners and uh, would you folks like to make a few comments? I see Wendy moving there. Wendy, would you care to make a few comments? And then I'm going to come back to uh, Janet. Wow. 
I, I'm, I'm shocked. So pardon me if I stumble for a few minutes. I was so impressed by the the write-ups I saw of the other two ladies and your accomplishments. I Congratulations. It should be all of us because you've done so many great things. I want to first thank the township for putting me forth and nominating me. Uh, I've worked hard with the township and it is a partnership, like everything. Uh, and this event, for you guys to put this on this year in COVID, my congratulations to you and your team. Um, the people, though, the people that really make community happen are all the volunteers. They just need somebody to step up and be willing to put their face out there. And I want to make sure that this award is for them as much as for me, because it takes a team of people to make things happen. And then it takes negotiation and support. So I'm honored, just shocked actually, um, to have, I, I never dreamt I was going to win. Um, but I do love Rockport but, uh, and the whole area. I love going to Merrillville and to the stores there. And we are blessed to be in Eastern Ontario in so many ways We have our small villages. And it takes all of the people to make those villages attractive to other people. Uh, the volunteers do more than anybody really realizes to help the economic of this area. People want to move here and it's because our villages look good when they come, they go into the shops, they spend money in the stores and we are a destination by being rural. And I'm proud to be in rural Eastern Ontario in Leeds Grenville. And thank you for this. I'm just, I'm amazed. Thank you, proud. Humble. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wendy, uh, for those very kind words, uh, uh, speaking on behalf of the entire uh, Eastern Ontario and United Counties of Leeds and Grenville region. Uh, and I know that uh, Bill Fake would be very uh, proud of the work that you do in your community. Uh, now I'll, uh, I'll turn to, uh, to Janet. Janet, would you like to say a few words? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I'm, perhaps, perhaps, Janet, I should have introduced you as Mrs. McGarrickle, should I? <laughs> That's right. I do get called the mustard lady a lot. <laughs> I'm also very shocked and uh, extremely honoured um, and just to be nominated alongside um, women like um, Wendy and Karen and all that you have done for your community. It's just, uh, it's amazing and uh, you're a real inspiration uh, to me for all the work that you've done for your communities. Um, and uh, I think the best, the best thing I ever did was um, move to Merrickville with my tiny mustard company 31 years ago. It was a great place to, to grow and to raise a family and to grow the business. And it's an amazing community uh, that I'm very proud of. And now with so many fantastic local producers that we can feature and brag about in the store and promote. Um, Every day is, uh, I, I love my work and uh, I feel really privileged. Um, and also um, all of the support that I've had from the, uh, the mayor and the community uh, of Merrickville in general. Um, and from uh, Leeds Grenville Economic Development, uh, Anne and Deanna have always been a uh, big um, force on my side and always been very, very supportive. So. I'm so grateful and so honored uh, and inspired by you both. And uh, thank you for all the hard work for putting this together as well uh, online. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Janet, uh, Mrs. McGarrickle. Uh, appreciate those words as well. And again, I know that uh, Bill Fake would be very proud of the work that, that you do uh, in your community. But I also want to recognize all of the nominees for putting, for uh, having their names or allowing their names to be put forward. And, uh, and I know that all of you are economic development officers uh, in your communities, working hard uh, at your businesses and uh, wish you all the very best. And I'll turn the podium back over here to Ann Weir. Thank you. Wow. Congratulations to all of you. We are honored to have such amazing individuals uh, in Leeds Grenville. After the summit, we'll be making arrangements with each municipality to present your wards uh, in person and nominee certificates.
So without further ado, I would like to call upon the Honourable Steve Clark to introduce our keynote session, Minister Clark. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much. And first, uh, I want to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, uh, Wendy and Janet on uh, the Bill Fake uh, Economic Development Award. I also want to congratulate uh, Karen for all the work that you've done with uh, with Kemp Alive. I, I can't think of uh, three more dynamic women who uh, have done so much for our riding. So congratulations to to everyone. Now it's uh, it's my distinct honor uh, and pleasure uh, to introduce uh, our next speaker. My my good, good friend, uh, the Honorable Vic Fidelli, Ontario's Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Uh, Minister Fidelli was uh, elected uh, to the legislature in the 2011 election after uh, a tremendous career, both as a former mayor of the city of North Bay, but a very, very successful uh, business person uh, running a very successful marketing company, one of uh, Ontario's 50 best managed companies for many, many years. Uh, I've come to uh, get to know uh, Vic uh, and his wife, uh, Patty. Uh, they're fantastic people. They've done so much for the city of North Bay and the riding of Nipissing. In fact, uh, you know, for the large part of my uh, career at the Ontario legislature over the last 10 years, uh, the person that I've been the seatmate with the most uh, has been Vic Fidelli. So I've got to, to know Vic uh, who became uh, our interim leader and the leader of the PC party when we were in opposition uh, after we were elected uh, in 2018 as, uh, as the government under Premier Ford. Vic uh, presented uh, a tremendous budget uh, as finance minister, which I really believe set the stage for the way we were able to respond to the pandemic. And since he's become Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, he's just done such tremendous work He's helped our riding immensely. He is a great friend, a very dynamic speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, the Honorable Dick Fidelli. Well, thank you, Steve, uh, uh, Minister Clark. Thank you very, very much for a most generous introduction. Uh, I'll get you back in a few minutes, Steve, don't worry. Good morning, everybody. And thank you very much to the Leeds Grenville Economic Development Summit team for organizing this uh, excellent forum to bring us together, albeit virtually this year. It's great to be joining uh, my cabinet colleague, Steve Clark, uh, MP Michael Barrett, the new warden Roger Haley, and the community and business leaders of Leeds Grenville. And we also want to congratulate Janet Campbell and Wendy Merkley, the recipients of the Bill Fake Memorial Economic Development Leadership Award. Look, I don't have to tell you, this has been a very difficult year for people and businesses in our province, in our country, and quite frankly, around the world. Eight months ago, uh, your professional and personal lives looked a lot different than they do today. Businesses, workers, families all across Ontario have had to grapple with the effects of this virus. However, by working together, we can continue to fight COVID-19 and follow the right path to economic recovery and growth. Look, we've seen some really important and positive developments. Employment in Ontario uh, in the month of October actually increased by 30,600, marking that as the fifth straight month of overall employment gains. The total employment gains over the last five months is almost 900,000. But of most interest to us is the fact that this very morning, 11,500 more men and women woke up this morning to go to work in manufacturing than before the pandemic. 11,500 more manufacturing jobs today than in February. And to us, that indicates that we are still the economic heartland, but we're also uh, stabilizing here in Ontario. We know there's much more work to do and maintaining a healthy workforce is gonna be critical to our economic recovery. And I, I know that our 2020 budget is a testament to that. It's Ontario's action plan, protect, support, recover. And it sets out $45 billion in support over three years. And it looks to the longer term, really with some foundational changes to address some critical barriers to Ontario's competitiveness. 
So this includes, and I know in uh, uh, Brockville, there will be many industries who are thrilled with this. It includes a comprehensive plan to address Ontario's electricity prices starting January 1. A portion of the high cost electricity contracts will be funded by the province, not by the ratepayers, resulting in medium size and larger industrial and commercial employers saving anywhere between 14 and 16 percent starting January 1. They'll save that on their electricity bills. And I can think of right off the top of my head five companies uh, 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 that will be in, just in Brockville in a small area of Brockville that will be absolutely with, thrilled with this. On top of that, that's, that's about a billion three that it uh, that it will save the business community. On top of this, there are significant reductions in property and employer health taxes as well. The property taxes alone will be reduced in Ontario. The, 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 the province's business education tax portion of your local property tax bill will, reduce, will be reduced by more than 10%. That's about a $450 million savings to business each and every year now. This is permanent. We're also uh, boosting and retraining uh, for the skilled trades with a focus on helping those particular workers most affected by the pandemic to retrain and upgrade their skills into the jobs that are waiting, the ones that I mentioned earlier. And we're also building critical infrastructure. This includes an overall investment of nearly $1 billion to expand and improve broadband and cellular across rural and northern communities and taken together with the actions we've already implemented over the last two years to lower the cost of doing business. Businesses now save nearly $7 billion each and every year going forward. And that's from uh, reducing WSIB payments by more than almost 50%, I should say it's about 47%, but putting in an accelerated capital cost allowance where you can now write off uh, your new equipment in year and all of those other things, including now the the property taxes and the uh, electricity rates, $7 billion lower to operate in Ontario every year now than it was on the day we got elected. And quite frankly, this unleashes the job creators to do what you do best, even in times of economic uncertainty. Now, as our budget makes clear, we're working across all fronts to help Ontario businesses and your workers weather the challenges of this global pandemic. A key lesson from COVID-19 is that we need to grow our domestic supply chain to reduce our reliance on other countries for essential supplies. Remember, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were faced with a situation where critical supplies and equipment were suddenly in short supply. Premier Ford said that day, never again will we in Ontario be caught without the vital equipment that we need. And then that has not only uh, happened, but it's also spilled over into other areas of manufacturing in Ontario. So now we make ventilators, masks, hand sanitizer, wipes. Uh, they were hard to access. They were hard to find in stores. Hospitals, care providers, other organizations needed to secure a steady supply. And those supply lines were vulnerable. And businesses, some of them uh, part of critical supply chains, had shuttered. And you know who came through? It was Ontario businesses. Uh, Premier Ford and our entire government is so incredibly proud of how Ontario's business sector responded to COVID-19. You responded with speed and ingenuity to these immense uh, business and economic challenges that the pandemic created. Our part as a government is setting up Ontario Together portal as a way to receive all of your great ideas. And then we introduced the $50 million Ontario Together Fund for submissions that needed a little extra help getting off the ground. In addition, businesses like 3M and Greenfield Global here in your region answered our call. And I'm going to tell you right now, that is absolutely in no small, in no small part due to the extremely hard work from your MPP, our colleague, Minister Steve Clark, now, right at the beginning of this. He said to me, Vic, I'm going to lay out a couple of great opportunities for, for COVID-19. And as a result, we got together with 3M Canada and we're joined by the federal government to develop a made in Ontario approach to securing those masks that our frontline health professionals depend on. 
that new 3M facility under construction in Brockville right now uh, will produce N95 masks in the new year to help meet provincial, national, and private sector demand throughout the pandemic and beyond. And then there's Greenfield Global, another great story for the region and the province. With our government's investment of two and a half million dollars, Greenfield is scaling up to make over 114 million liters of high purity, specialty grade alcohol annually. This is for hand sanitizers, right? This is enough to make over 150 million one liter bottle, uh, bottles of hand sanitizers if all their output is used for that project. And Greenfield is investing $75 million in this project in Johnstown. And that's a significant investment that will create opportunities for families, businesses, and the community. And, and I don't want this to sound like a commercial, but I have to say it again. There was tremendous pressure to locate both of those plants in other locations. And through consistent, dogged efforts of my former seatmate, Steve Clark, they landed where they did. I will tell you, they never would have happened without Steve. And both of these projects are now going to help Ontario families, healthcare, frontline workers to continue to combat COVID-19 safely and effectively. They will strengthen our province's domestic supply chains and further expand our manufacturing might as the workshop of Canada. It's reducing our dependence on unreliable foreign supply chains now and in the case of future pandemics. So it's their ingenuity and their commitment to delivery is what we call the Ontario spirit. And that spirit is very much behind another program called Ontario Made. And just a few short months ago, we teamed up with the Canadian manufacturers and exporters to launch that Ontario Made program we, together with CME, unveiled the new Ontario made branding and put the call out to our world-class manufacturers to register their products on the supportontariomade.ca website. And I gotta tell you, we're not disappointed by the remarkable response we received. To date, there's over 1,550 manufacturers and 210 retailers who've registered six thousand Ontario made products as part of the Ontario made program. Retailers all across the province are participating in Ontario made in-store promotions. I can tell you I was in my uh, home hardware on the weekend and it's by paint and there's a huge Ontario made banner in the aisle. You pick up the beauty tone paint and there right imprinted in within the label is the Ontario made logo. So consumers can now quickly and easily identify these products that are Ontario made. And now there's a searchable directory at supportontariomade.ca and in stores that you can look up and see what's made in Ontario. In a recent poll, there were 73% of Ontarians said they already tried to purchase Canadian made products. They turn the bottles around and see if they're made in Canada. And since COVID-19, 56% of Ontarians said they would try to purchase domestic goods more often. And the people of Ontario can now use their purchasing power to support local businesses, local jobs, right in your own community. You know the products that are made right there. You can help our economy recover from the impacts of COVID-19. And again, businesses have already enthusiastically stepped up to partner with uh, with uh, uh, the CME on this. In, in the Eastern region, you've got the Ontario made logo can be seen on products. I'm gonna miss a whole bunch, but I'll just tell you a couple. Best Adirondack Chair Company in Kempville, Kilmarnock Enterprises, which makes robotics in Smith Falls, Top Shelf Distillers over in Perth. When you buy Ontario made, you're doing more than shopping. You're supporting Ontario jobs, Ontario businesses, and your neighbors and Ontario families and communities all across the province. So visit supportontariomade.ca to see how you can qualify for the Ontario Made logo or uh, connect with your local businesses for Made in Ontario products. Now look, with such strong uh, domestic support and international respect for the quality of products made here, it's no surprise more businesses worldwide are choosing Ontario as their destination for growth. 
just in the last few weeks, we've seen some landmark announcements. We all have heard them. Ford is making Ontario their global hub for their electric vehicle manufacturing. And then we've heard from further announcements from Fiat Chrysler and General Motors. All, all in, we're seeing $5 billion injected into the auto industry. Come on, when is the last time Ontario ever saw $5 billion in auto investment in 30 days? And Roche, the world's largest biotech company, chose the province of Ontario for their $500 million global pharma technical operations site. We're seizing on this momentum and we're creating a new agency, Invest Ontario. And it, that is our new investment attraction agency. And that's going to energize the province's work to secure strategic projects and bolster our economy specifically in the areas of advanced manufacturing, life sciences, and technology. We already have uh, superiority in those three, and so those are the ones we'll be chasing first. Invest Ontario will make Ontario more competitive, attracting new investment, creating good jobs across all of the province, and positioning Ontario as open for business. I also want to acknowledge the significant contribution that small businesses make to our economy. Uh, we've never seen it highlighted more than now. And that's why we want our small businesses and others across Ontario to be able to keep the lights on through the worst of this dark period. We also want them to look forward to a brighter future ahead. And we're determined to make use of everything available in our toolbox to create the conditions for that to happen. We launched the Main Street Recovery Grant. Uh, that's a one-time grant that will reimburse eligible small businesses for PPE costs that they've incurred since the outbreak of COVID-19. So that's about 60,000 small businesses with two to nine employees who are eligible to receive a, a grant of up to $1,000. We're also modernizing regulations to allow delivery to restaurants and businesses that serve them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're offering $2,500 grants through the Digital Main Street Program. That's a great program for our shops who are competing with those online. This will help nearly 23,000 small businesses uh, put them online and help them serve new and existing customers, again, online. Uh, and just yesterday, we announced that Ontario is investing over $2.2 million to provide small businesses with a tailored financial advice and online training and resources that will help them stay open and recover from COVID-19. With our support, Small Business COVID-19 Recovery Network, Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada, and Financial Advisors Association of Canada will provide small businesses with free tailored advice, including managing risks and pandemic recovery, cash management during uncertain times, and information on the small business tax. Now, these are just some of the programs and services we're working to help small business. We'll continue to look for ways to support small businesses in the weeks and months ahead to help them. We want them to reopen safer, rehire faster, and reemerge from this crisis stronger than before. We also know that to help our economy recover from this pandemic, every corner of the province needs to be engaged to succeed. And one way we're continuing to ensure that happens is through the regional programs like the Eastern Ontario Development Fund. With our supports, Businesses like uh, CanArm right here in Leeds and Grenville are creating good jobs, building the foundation for families and communities and driving regional economies. Our business advisors were also busy supporting manufacturers across all of Eastern Ontario as they faced unprecedented downturns. The Small Business Enterprise Centers continued to support smaller businesses through programs like Starter Company Plus, and our ministry staff were there for every step of the way, helping businesses pivot their operations and support their new realities. We all know this has been a year like no other. And as we thankfully draw close to the end of 2020, 
we're reminded how families came together in the best and the worst of times to support each other. Our government will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with Ontarians to work across all fronts to help families, businesses, and communities weather the challenges of this global pandemic. So thank you for being here today, for showing your Ontario spirit as we make this journey together. It's a journey that will not only ensure that Ontario, the economic engine of Canada, revs up again, but one where we unleash the full and powerful potential of Ontario onto the world. Thank you. Minister Fidelli, thank you so much. And certainly uh, Ontario, what a great place to live. And we are so fortunate to be in this province. And uh, for those people uh, who are with us today, if you're wanting to ask the minister a question, uh, go to the hand up icon. I know we've got a few of you that have sent us, is this the right icon? Yes, it is. It's the one with the hand up. Uh, so send them in, uh, the questions in and uh, uh, minister will be, uh, got a few questions for you already. So uh, from Sandra Lawn, we had, how are rural communities on, on, in Ontario expected to participate and succeed in the post-pandemic economic recovery. So I think the focus is on rural Ontario. Oh, Minister, I think we, yep. there we go. Thank you very much for the question. You know, we have uh, developed a tremendous amount of programs for all areas of Ontario. Uh, when I think of, uh, I live in Northern Ontario and, and I live in a small town of 4,800 people, Corbeil, Ontario. So I live in rural Ontario and, and, and appreciate your question. I think the first thing that we need to know is that we're spending, investing a billion dollars in broadband. And that is so very, very important. You know, I, I think about uh, operating my portion of the Ministry of Economic Development from, uh, I call it the bunker, in Corbeil. And I'm dealing with uh, people worldwide, in, in uh, whether it's in Japan or in Korea, India, Mexico, and I'm able to do that because on the highway that I live on, we have broadband and we need that expanded right across the rural and, and uh, uh, northern Ontario. Uh, we have um, a lot of investment in going into training uh, uh, supports. Uh, part of that is going to be $181 million in employment services training programs, and that's to help people who are most affected by this pandemic find employment in uh, jobs that are going to be available, jobs that are more available today. I talked about it earlier. There's 11,500 people woke up this morning to go to manufacturing jobs that weren't uh, there before COVID. So it's, it's going to be investment in broadband. It's going to be investment in skills training and all of the other supports that we've put in place. Uh, I'll try to keep my answers short. <laughs> and that was a short one. No, thank you. And, you know, maybe we should talk a little bit more about the Ontario made product, because I understand that's a question uh, we get quite often at our constituency office of, you know, as a local consumer, whether it be our winner of rewards, Mrs. McGarrigles or one of the others, what, you know, what's the importance and uh, perhaps highlight a little bit, go back and highlight a little bit more on that. Well, look, I think this is one of the most exciting programs we've done. It just, it draws everybody together. And, you know, this, uh, I'll credit Premier Ford with this. Uh, uh, he, he started by saying, look, you're in a Canadian tire uh, in, in, on the weekend and you're going to buy a barbecue and you've got this opportunity to buy a Weber barbecue made in Chicago or a Napoleon barbecue made in Barrie, Ontario. Now, all things being equal, pick up a product made in Ontario find out if it is. And so we realized that people weren't always aware. So this uh, Canadian manufacturers and exporters, we worked with them to develop Ontario made. And you'll see this logo now, as I said, there's, there's thousands of products that have it from the Beauty Tone paint, PepsiCo, uh, Frito-Lay, all of these companies right down the chain. We, we, we were at a, a ship manufacturer in Hamilton, uh, and there's an entire ship that was built in Ontario featuring a big sticker, Ontario made on the side of the ship. So this is to help you have a choice. It's to help you identify that one is made in Ontario. When I pick that one up, I'm supporting my friends and neighbors down the street who work at this company. Uh, and so that is the real uh, impetus behind doing this. And it helps you participate. 
with your, your swelling pride in Ontario and your spirit, it helps you participate in our recovery. Absolutely. And I know uh, today as part of uh, mylocalmarkets.ca, uh, we've been promoting our local food products. And so you mentioned a sticker, you get the sticker and you can start to promote. And I think, you know, uh, that's, that's uh, you know, rural, I think communities have so much pride in their local products. And uh, certainly we would uh, want to make sure our local products there. So perhaps should we issue a local challenge, Vic? <laughs> I'd love it. They can go on supportontariomade.ca. And it's not just putting a sticker on it. This is really being part of it. There's an electronic newsletter. There is a huge promotion. You're going to start to see more and more and more. Uh, you know, we're, we're really amping up our, uh, the, our uh, provincial involvement in Ontario Made. Premier talks about it virtually every day. Be part of it. Be part of the success story. It's just, it is just so cool to go into a store and see that branding now that's uh, on the products. I, I tend to agree. I know myself, um, my staff laugh at me a little bit, but I do not have an Amazon account. I'm really proud to uh, uh, to make sure I'm not, I'm going to our local producers and uh, as much as possible providing uh, jobs locally. Um, so Mr. So Fidel, let, let, me interrupt then. let me just interrupt on that. So I really urge all of the businesses that are, are on this uh, Google, go on Ontario.ca, the website, and look for the, um, the digital Main Street program. This program puts cash in your hand and gives you uh, expertise to take your store, your retail store, whether it's out of your house or actually on a Main Street, but it's digital Main Street, to help you get online. This is going to be so very important to you, uh, especially at this time of year. Uh, super. Mr. Fidel, I don't know, do you know much about the community demonstration microgrids or is that another ministry we'd have to, I guess there was just another a provincial announcement on that just recently. Uh, community, new community demonstration microgrids. Didn't know if that's a question for you or perhaps another. Uh, I'll leave that in, uh, in Minister Clark's hands to answer one day. Okay, there we <laughs> go. Um, and I guess the question, uh, you know, we have both, we're very fortunate, we're a diverse economy locally. We have manufacturing, and uh, but we also have our tourism and hospitality sector. Uh, and I know that overlaps with Lisa, uh, Minister Lisa McLeod. Uh, can you touch on that a little bit of what's happening for that industry specific? Yeah, you're going to see, you're, you've continued to uh, hear from Minister McLeod. She's been doing just an absolutely great job of, of finding the supports you know, within the, 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 the government sort of resources that are being pulled in every direction. Um, so there's always been uh, uh, Lisa's at the table, making sure that uh, all of the sectors that she represents are heard from. Um, with a lot of stakeholder meetings, she has a tremendous amount of stakeholder meetings and comes back to cabinet and talks to us about, well, here's what's needed next and here's why. And uh, so that's been a big help, but, but even uh, of more, interest uh, in, in that is for all of the people who have lost a job in in those uh, sectors that have been most affected you know she'll say to you they were hit first hit the hardest and will be the longest to recover um, so what we're doing is we're providing those workers with the skilled training availability 181 million dollars and that is going to help those who are most impacted by the pandemic, such as tourism and hospitality workers, and it's going to help them connect with jobs that are in high demand today. So that's another avenue of how we're helping those in the tourism and hospitality sectors. Excellent. Well, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Roger Haley, our uh, warden-elect, to uh, uh, say thank you. And uh, But uh, Roger, are you there? I am. Okay. Yes. Okay, uh, Minister Fidelli, on behalf of the Warden SAO and uh, the Council of the United Counties of Leeds and Granville, I want to thank you for taking this time to share your plans, which will continue to uh, successfully steer Ontario through these very tough economic times. You mentioned programs and, and several businesses in, in this region, which the government's uh, partnered with to help us uh, get through this, and that, that's great, and, and it's, uh, it's very helpful. So now, as, as Anne mentioned, uh, as a token of our appreciation, we'll be sending you a package from my local markets, uh, which will be full of Leeds Granville products, and they are on the Made in Ontario list. So um, 
again, uh, Mr. Fidelity, thank you very much for your, for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Roger. Thank you, uh, Anne, and everybody for allowing me this uh, opportunity to, uh, to have a chat. We're, we're going to get through this. We're there to support you. And we are going to be seeing Ontario unleashed uh, in the next few months. So thank you. Thank you, Minister Fridelli. We'll certainly make sure our, uh, Mr. Clark continues to be very close beside you and you are welcome anytime in Leeds Grendel. Take care and thanks so much. Thank you. Next, it is my pleasure to call upon Jim Pine and Lisa Severson from the Eastern Ontario Regional Network. The pandemic has certainly brought a spotlight of importance to connectivity in the region. Welcome, Jim. Welcome, Lisa. I know a tremendous amount of work has been done by you both and the funding has been received and there's more to be announced. So I'm going to turn it over to the both of you to give everyone an update and thank you for doing this today. Oh, and sorry, just a reminder, if you have any questions for uh, Lisa and Jim uh, to go to the, pan the icon with a hand up and uh, we'll get them at the end of their presentation. Over to you. That's great. Thanks so much, Anne. And um, it's great to be back at the summit again this year. Um, I think the slide deck, um, sorry, I see it up in the corner. Um, if we can just jump uh, right to the next slide. Great. So we're going to just give a quick recap some of the information you saw last year when we were here uh, some of the newer information around the 5010 and gig analysis will be done by jim and i'm going to give everybody a quick update on the cell project so if we can go to the next slide please so basically um i just want to refresh everybody's memory again about the first project, uh, what happened, it was completed in 2015. 94.5%, um, almost 95% of Leeds and Grenville received services up to 10 megabits. Um, there were two zones in UCLG. Um, they were awarded to Bell, Storm and ExploreNet. And um, the return on investment uh, from that project for the county was 26 to one, which is a great um, way to spend uh, taxpayers' dollars. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. We're gonna jump right into uh, the cell project. So what the cell project's goals are, is we want to um, achieve 99% coverage in our demand area. And the demand area is where people live, people work, and where people travel on major roadways. We want everyone to be able, we want 99% of that area that you're able to make a voice call. So if your car breaks down on the side of the road or you have to participate in say a work meeting uh, via a call, you're able to do that while you're on the road or from your home or at your place of work. We know we have, we have that accurate um, information in regards to the demand area. Uh, we had to purchase impact data so we know where uh, people live and people work. Um, and so we feel that we've done a great job in figuring out um, where folks really do need the services. Our next goal is to re receive 95% coverage in that same demand area with standard definition. So with that service level, um, you would be able to do emails, web browsing, um, social media, et cetera, banking, um, which is key sometimes when you're on the road um, and you need to check what's, what's left in the account. Um, and our final um, goal that we hope to achieve is 85% coverage in the same area with high definition service levels. So that way you could participate in a Zoom call, um, stream movies, um, and other more intensive data um, applications that we use today. We can go on to the next uh, slide, please. This is just a quick breakdown of how the um, $213 million project will roll out. So the EOWC and EOMC members have each con uh, jointly contributed $10 million towards the project. 
Canada and um, Ontario have both have both committed $71 million. And it's anticipated that the uh, telecom service providers will also have to invest at least $61 million into the network. So um, the overall total for the project at this point is $213 million. And the United County of Leeds and Grenville's share for the project is almost $635,000. We can go on to the next slide. So how can municipalities help? So this is a cellular network that we will be upgrading, um, filling in the gaps for coverage and capacity. So that means cell towers need to be built. Um, municipalities can provide municipal lands um, that they would consider having towers uh, constructed on. Uh, we know now that there will be well over 150 towers of varying sizes constructed um, throughout the region. Um, we really do um, stress that we think it's very important for the local municipalities to have tower siting uh, plans and protocols in place. Um, you are the local land use authorities and you will be approached by the telecom communications service providers um, in regards to the construction of those towers in your municipalities. Uh, we are creating um, resource documents uh, that can be used to assist you uh, with those types of, of um, protocols and plans. And uh, those will be out early 2021 in January. Um, as well, FCM also has great uh, resource material on their website. And AMO has also, uh, AMO in partnership with Roma, have also issued um, resource documents that can be accessed. And um, finally, we would like to ask and hope that the municipalities will work with the telecommunication service providers on permitting. Um, we, we do agree that the TSPs need to uh, do their due diligence, um, but we're hoping that if there's a number of towers um, that may be going into your municipality, that there's ways that maybe we can expedite permitting such as building permits, et cetera. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So I'm just gonna give you a quick status. So of our project, <clears throat> our full team complement was hired March 30th. So we have uh, 11 members total. And then we have Jim um, and two other CAOs who are our co-leads. Uh, the transfer payment agreement was signed with the province May 15th, 2020. Uh, we issued the request for proposal for the, um, uh, for the cell project on April 20th. It closed September the 3rd. We have been in um, completing the evaluation process. Uh, since that time, we're very close um, on, on choosing a preferred proponent. Uh, once that preferred proponent is, um, is chosen, we will enter into contract negotiations with them and we're hoping um, that we have a final contract awarded uh, by February or at least the first quarter of 2021. And um, we're also hoping that con construction can start in 2021. It will be um, approximately a five-year build. We're hoping to be complete. Uh, the entire project will be done by 2025. And then there's ongoing contract, um, contract monitoring until 2030. Um, so stay tuned. Um, we will have more information to share uh, in uh, early 2021. Um, as to the progress, we will be coming back to the counties and the municipalities, um, letting them know what um, an initial design may look like and what that means for your, uh, for your area and your, your municipalities. So I'm going to turn it now over to Jim, who will talk a little bit about the um, 5010 uh, megabit per second and gig analysis that we completed on behalf of the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus. And there's some great information that you'll hear. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Lisa. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Warden Haley and, and Anne for the invitation again. It's always great to be back. It leads in Grenville has always been a, uh, a real leader for us in, as we've tried to improve broadband across the region and we appreciate your continued support. 
this is a great opportunity to tell you where we're at. So and if we could go to the next slide, uh, which is, uh, I guess, starting with the reality of getting to 5010. <clears throat> Back in, uh, in 2000, as we were starting to uh, really uh, push hard on the cell project, the Wardens Caucus, Leeds and Granville, uh, my county, Hastings, and, and of course the other members uh, said that we realize that we can't sit still, that we've got to continue to try and improve uh, broadband at people's homes or in their businesses. So the EOWC asked EORN to undertake an analysis of, of how we could get uh, our region to uh, at least a minimum of 5010, the CRTC standard. And then they also asked us to do uh, a look at what would be an inspirational or transformational project uh, and that we call the GIG uh, project. But so our first steps was to find out where we really stood in terms of the 5010 minimum standard that the CRTE had set. And we did that analysis with our engineers. And uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, where we're at is about 46% of our rural homes and businesses have access to 5010. The remainder don't. And even if you put the cities in the urban areas, it only gets our region to about 63% of the minimum standard. So what it really meant is that we have a lot of work to make sure that our region is uh, connected at, even at the minimum new standard of, of 5010. So if we can go to the next slide. The, the work that we had to do was when we knew that there was a problem was to figure out uh, how to fix it, of course, and what the cost might be. So we did a detailed market failure analysis uh, and a costing uh, for both the projects at 5010 and the transformational one, the gig, and you can see uh, on uh, on that this slide uh, what we were really talking about in terms of the technology in a 5010 project uh, we're talking about 75 percent uh, of the uh, solution is through wireline fiber or, or coax cable and 20 percent uh, uh, using wireless solutions and that would get us to uh, the 90 percent in, in each county's demand area as a minimum and hopefully we would do much better and on the gig side, that really is uh, about bringing a thousand megabits up to up to a thousand megabits of speed to people's homes and business to 95% of our demand area. And it's all about using a, a wired solution, a piece of fiber or a, or a cable that could deliver those speeds. So those were the two projects that we uh, we wanted to cost based on the uh, on the technologies. And if we go to the next slide, uh, here you can see the cost estimates. Uh, these are our big projects, obviously. To do a minimum project at 5010, it's between 500 and 750 million dollars, depending on the cost of uh, of getting access to hydro poles. And we've been able to sort of uh, narrow that down to what would it look like for Leeds and Grenville if you were doing a 5010 project on your own? It's about 120 million dollars to to do uh, that project. And if you're looking at a gig project for the region, across the region, uh, it's between 1.2 and 1.6 billion. And in UCLG, uh, it would be about 162 million to do that, that bigger project. You are a little more densely populated in, in spots uh, and have a little bit better uh, access to poles and stuff than in other parts of the region, but it's still a significant cost if you were trying to do this uh, on your own. Um, the next slide, is a representation of, uh, of the demand areas. And Lisa's mentioned this in terms of, of the cell project. But, but this gives you a good idea of uh, where we think uh, all of the demand is. Uh, the pinky areas represent more densely populated areas where there are more users, more devices. Green areas uh, between two and, and 20 household equivalents, as we call it. The blue is, is between uh, one and two. And in the white areas, there's simply nobody living there. Uh, there's largely no roads going through. Uh, and so there's no demand. And it's important to know where the demand is so that in a project, we can uh, make sure that we get to those areas. Uh, the next slide just gives you a little bit better idea what it looks like in the, in the counties itself. Again, you can see where the population are. We've used very detailed impact data that we've purchased from uh, impact in order to figure out exactly where people are and to figure out our, our demand areas so that we can make sure we, we cover them in a project. The same kind of idea um, for a gig project uh, exists. Um, this again shows you where the demand areas are uh, across uh, UCLG. If we can go to the very next, uh, the next slide, 
uh, slide number 15, is the, uh, the EORN demand comparison to the um, federal ICED supply uh, uh, study that they've done. This really, I, I like to call this, this is the magnitude of our challenge slide. The green areas represent where the federal government through ICED tells us that there is uh, access to that minimum 50 uh, down, 10 up uh, standard. The pink areas represent the demand areas where we know that that standard needs to get to. And it really does show you what, uh, what we face in terms of putting projects together. But this is what we do best at EORN in terms of uh, doing regional projects. And this is what we want to accomplish in either the 5010 or the gig uh, uh, project. The next slide, slide number 16, again, just shows you uh, in more detail where you're at in uh, Leeds and Grenville in terms of the currently available access to 5010 down. And you can see that there are some areas that have it, some of the more uh, urban areas, but there's still a lot of the United Counties that needs to get access to at least that minimum of 5010 service. Next slide, if you don't mind. <clears throat> we have done, so in, uh, in the early summer in June, the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus uh, uh, and uh, now the Eastern Ontario Mayor's uh, Committee uh, landed on the fact that we should be pursuing the gig project, the bigger project, the one that would bring fiber to people's homes and businesses and be really transformational uh, for the short and for the long term. We uh, at EORN um, went out and uh, had uh, separate independent economic analysis done by uh, economists uh, who looked at what a gig project might mean for the region. And, and of course, your conference today is all about economic development and growth. And here's just a couple of examples uh, of uh, points that the uh, two economists who did their studies separately, but came to similar conclusions, thankfully, uh, said that there would be in terms of impacts. Doing a gig project is going to create a lot of jobs, uh, upwards at the upper end of about 16,000 new jobs, full-time equivalents uh, over five years of construction. It would create um, about 430 million to 720 million dollars in employment earnings. So that's people being employed and getting earnings over those five years. The governments themselves uh, would see their investments returned uh, because we're asking Ontario and Canada in a gig project for a contribution of 200 million dollars each. Uh, but those governments would see a return on their investments fairly quickly uh, over five years because it would produce uh, growth in the region. Even at just 0.78, they would see their money back in about five years. Um, the next slide, I think there may be some more. If we can go to the next slide. Um, there are other benefits to a pro doing a big project. Obviously, people don't have to commute as much. So telecommuting results in reductions in greenhouse gas uh, emissions, and they calculate between about 200 kilograms a reduction uh, per capita. That's substantial. It's going to help us deliver healthcare better across the region, and they estimate a savings of about 170 million to the healthcare sector. It also, they tell us that doing a gig, uh, getting that kind of capacity at people's homes raises property values, and they estimate about 3% or a $7,500 net increase in property values. For local municipalities, there's a benefit as well, because as the uh, wealth of the communities uh, uh, grow and people come, they're estimating that there's an increase in property tax revenues. Economic development is all about generating new uh, assessment and, and growth to support uh, our program. So this is an, uh, a project that would certainly do that. And certainly just generally, it brings uh, uh, an increase in the GDP from uh, Eastern Ontario. They estimate uh, 300 million annually. It just makes good economic sense <clears throat> to do a project of this nature. Uh, from the studies that we've received. And so we're happy to share it really for the first time publicly uh, at your, your conference. So um, we are uh, working hard with uh, federal and uh, provincial folks to try and put this gig project uh, together uh, so that we can do it uh, across the region and certainly in you know, United Counties of, uh, of Leeds and Grenville. So the next slide, as I said, uh, is just uh, together we can we can make a difference working together, and and we've also got we've got the mandate from the EOWC and the Mayor's Committee uh, to push forward on it. 
And I think we may be down to um, uh, a slide on funding streams, but I'll stop, I'll stop there. And Lisa, if you wanted to pick up, you can do that. Absolutely. So these next few slides just talk about um, some of the funding streams uh, that are currently um, out or in process. So federal funding streams right now, the Connect to Innovate, they're hoping that that funding stream um, will be completed. Uh, any projects that they've decided to fund uh, will be completed by 2023. Um, I in my research, I did not find any of the CTI funding um, that was um, in Leeds and Granville particular, but there are some projects uh, within the EORN region. Um, they are not complete yet, uh, so it will be um, it will be great when those um, are actually done. The CRTC funding stream uh, is seven hundred and fifty million dollars. Uh, that is uh, a funding stream that only the um, TSPs are able to apply to. They just had a second round of of that funding stream uh, open, it closed in June, and those um, applications are being uh, reviewed at this point in time. As everyone has probably seen, and, and we have received um, calls um, about this and inquiries, the Universal Broadband Fund was just announced on November the 9th. It's a $1.7 billion program that they hope to roll out um, and have completed by 2026. Um, and so it's, a, it's good news that the project that they've actually opened up the funding streams. Um, at this point in time, EORN is still uh, reviewing what the um, criteria is for um, application. Uh, they do have a rapid, uh, a rapid response uh, stream, <clears throat> excuse me, it's $150 million. Um, uh, that would be a stream that we would not be looking at. It's uh, we're looking, we require more funding than that. So we would be more interested in the more regional, um, larger project stream that they have available. So we're investigating um, our ability or, and the possibility to apply to that funding stream. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, the provincial funding stream, uh, as many of you have probably um, received um, possible requests for our resolutions of support uh, from uh, TSPs uh, for the Improving Connectivity for Ontario, ICON. Um, that uh, funding stream is open now. There, uh, it initially started with 150 million. The province uh, recently announced a top up to that funding uh, program of an additional $150 million. So it's now a $300 million funding stream. Um, and we do know that there are many uh, TSPs in the area that um, have interest um, in and have applied to that funding stream. Uh, EORN uh, to date has not applied as again, it's only a $300 million pot now. Um, and we're, our requirements for a gig project would be, um, would be more than what that funding stream uh, would be capable of providing. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. So the next steps for our for us at EORN is we are reviewing the UBF funding requirements. Um, as I stated, uh, we will continue to advocate to the provincial and federal government on um, the needs in Eastern Ontario for improved connectivity. And I do have to say and thank uh, both our MPs and MPPs. They've been um, fantastic to work with. Um, all are very supportive of the gig project. Um, so we'd like to thank them for that. Um, if we if we knew we could access funding, um, we for a gig project, we could have an RFP, a request for proposal, in place in the region by February of 2021, and the EORN model um, can be replicated across. Canada. It's a proven, it's a proven model uh, that we're very proud of um, and we know it works. And I think, uh, and I think that's it for us. Well, fabulous. Thank you, Lisa and Jim. Um, we, uh, of course, this uh, is a very important topic to our region. So you uh, 
you have several questions in the box waiting, but we have one. So for those who are uh, joining us, uh, again, the uh, icon with the hand up, please uh, submit your questions through there. We do have one that came in in advance uh, from Brian Purcell. Um, if you could uh, answer this would be, what would be a realistic timeline to have more reliable and faster connectivity for people in rural areas, including those now working remotely? Would it only be available from one provider or will people have a choice of providers? Can I turn that over to one of you? <laughs> Lisa's really good at answering those questions. <laughs> sure. So thanks very much, Brian, for your question. Um, like any infrastructure, um, it takes time to build out networks. Um, so as we stated, if, if we were able to receive uh, funding for a gig project, uh, let's say, um, and started the process in 2021, it would be at least a five-year build-out. Um, depending, you know, as areas, as the network was built out, those areas would be lit up, if you want to call it that, or if people would have access um, to those services before the actual end date. Um, but it does take time. Uh, we very much support competition, and we believe that it's important that um, uh, we look at all applications. We did, in our first project, provide funding to any um, TSP that did apply in our area. Um, and for example, um, in Leeds and Granville, uh, Bell, uh, Storm Internet, and uh, ExploreNet all received funding to, um, uh, to put infrastructure into to Leeds and Granville. So that was something that we did across the region. And so, yes, we very much support um, uh, competition. You know, if I can just add, Lisa, in terms of, of the gig project, we've gotten uh, a tremendous amount of support from our local MPs, Minister Clark uh, and, uh, and others who uh, see the merits of doing a project that, you know, as we say, is really transformational in the sense of being able to deliver, a, you know, upwards of a thousand megabits per second uh, to people's homes and businesses and more because fiber is so scalable, it could go even further than that. Because what we are hearing is that um, people would rather, I think, uh, do it, um, maybe un right's not the right word, but do it big enough that um, you don't have to keep coming back and trying to do project after project after project. So when we landed on the gig project, uh, the idea is, is that it gives you great certainty because it's a wired solution uh, and it's scalable and uh, you make the investment now and uh, you know, fiber's got a, at least a life of 20 years and more. Uh, so it, it made sense to, you know, to do this project. We're hoping we can put it together. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. And, uh, and as Lisa said, as we do a project like that, it'll be done in, in sections or zones and we'll encourage lots of competition uh, because there are lots of companies that could, uh, you know, provide that service. Right, and I know myself, I'm a big proponent of the gig pro uh, project. Uh, certainly from the fiber perspective, that is definitely the way that we need to go for the future. So we do have a question coming from the Mirror and Rideau Lakes area, Ari Hugenboom. Do you see a financial role for local governments to invest in local broadband and address the cell gap over and above the investments by the county? It, that, it's a really good question, uh, uh, Mayor Hogenboom, and, and it, it'll depend in part uh, on uh, whether or not we, I, from my perspective, whether we were able to put the gig per project uh, proposal and get that project going. Uh, it's based on a county contribution uh, and not, you know, going uh, to uh, each local municipality. But if that project is just isn't able to be put together, uh, you know, I'll always remain optimistic. Um, then it may be you will be asked by various uh, ISPs or TSPs to make individual contributions. I don't know for sure, I suspect you would be, um, but the value in doing it in a regional basis is we can aggregate it all uh, and um, any local, or any contribution municipally come, would come through the county. So, and it seems to be the most effective way, uh, at least from our point of view, to do this kind of work. So it's, I can't give you an exact answer. It just depends on, on where we end up. And if I can just add to that, um, we always state um, any broadband is good broadband. 
Um, so if there are projects happening in the municipal uh, level, at the municipal level, um, you know, we're supportive of that as well. Excellent, thank you. Another question from Eleanor. Will this broadband to the last, get us to the last mile in our rural homes outside of settlement areas? I'd say the answer is yes, because uh, in our modeling for uh, the gig project, uh, as we've said, we, we know where you live, <laughs> we know where businesses are located, and we built those locations into our demand uh, area map. Our idea is to get to at least 95% um, of the region, and that means homes and businesses, with a piece of fiber or, or a cable or whatever that could deliver the, uh, uh, you know, a minimum of a thousand megabits uh, to. We don't want to leave anybody behind. There will be, there may be some areas where it is just impossible, uh, and hopefully uh, LEO satellites might be a solution, but our goal is to try and get to um, people where they live uh, and, and where people are, are working with that piece of fiber so that you can have that certainty. Excellent. Thanks, Jim. Another question from Aman. I just noticed that the Westport area is way more covered than Brockville. Any explanations? So, Go ahead, Lisa. Well, I, um, I, I'm not sure what he means by covered. If, it, if you mean the pink color, the pink is the demand and the green is the I said uh, mapping overlay. So if there's a discrepancy in the green uh, on that mapping, um, th that would be um, a question that would have to be forwarded to ICED, um, but the pink in our mapping was where the demand is. Excellent. I don't know if that Yeah, we can, uh, we'll be posting the presentations online after, and uh, so we can take a little closer look at that after today's presentation. Um, so one from, uh, let's see, uh, one of the most important considerations for project affordability and reliability, but small businesses and residents are looking also for affordable price. Any thoughts on that? You know, everything that we've uh, tried to do in our, in our project uh, always has an eye on affordability. We've always said that building something that people can't use because they can't afford it really doesn't accomplish uh, what we need to do. Um, and we've had pretty good success, I think, in working with our, our partners that we have had in the first project uh, around uh, uh, pricing in the sense that it's a competitive world. And we've seen that uh, the pricing has been, uh, been competitive. If you were a Bell customer, you're getting a national pricing, whether you were in, uh, in Brockville or outside of the city uh, and versus Toronto or maybe Edmonton or someplace like that. They've gone with that national pricing, but it, that's why competitions is, is important, is to, is to help on the affordability side. And that's why we look for multiple partners. Um, so it's always something we try to do. Ultimately, the customer is with the, with the, the company that they connect with. Um, so. Excellent. Well, our time has expired, but uh, thank you so much for this update. I know it is so important to many of our uh, businesses as well as residents in this region. Uh, and certainly from a work perspective. And uh, today is just an, a great example of the connectivity that we needed in order to do this. We're actually at a slightly different location at 25 Central versus 32 Wall because they have fiber here. And mm. uh, so making sure we had the reliability for that connection was absolutely critical today. Um, as a token of our appreciation, we will both be receiving from mylocalmarkets.ca a customized Leeds Grenville food product. So I wish you uh, good yummies out of that bag. And uh, thank you so much for providing this update. And certainly if there's other questions for our panelists, uh, feel free to continue to put them in and we'll get them off to them. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone, have a good conference. Thank you. So next, uh, if you haven't ordered your lunch, uh, please make sure that you are uh, on the phone and putting in uh, online your lunch from a Leeds Grenville restaurant. And uh, the next part of our agenda, we're actually going to move into the economic update from myself. So we've got some slides here. I just got to move a couple of pages here. Uh, so it is my pleasure now to give you an update on county's economic development and how the past year has gone 
and the areas of focus for recovery. At the 2019 uh, summit, I provided you a full overview of the business retention and expansion report uh, that saw feedback from 300 businesses. The priorities from the report was then translated into strategic areas of focus for the next five years. Next slide. Counties uh, Council approved these areas of focus on January 29th, uh, 2020, and it just seemed like yesterday. I'm going to give you just a high level bullets on this, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail. I uh, bolded a few items on this because these are key items that have evolved in this year's environment. There was no surprises to our strategic areas of focus, uh, just an enhancement to our previous uh, strategic priorities. Uh, we're gonna continue developing our leadership capacity and um, building that. And today's summit is a prime example. At one point we had talked of, do we continue or not? But we certainly made sure this was a priority to bring our region together. We will continue to focus on investment readiness to support future opportunities while continuing to seek out investment in the region. And we will maintain a strong business visitation program. Next slide. A new strategic area, new to the strategic areas was talent attraction and workforce development. This came through loud and clear during our BRE report. Under marketing and communication, we will continue to update our tools and, and enhance our digital outreach. And today's a great example of that. We will focus on a diverse economy. Previously, uh, we were servicing all sectors and this modification is more reflective of the, our activities. The final item on that list there was um, responsive to local economy needs. And this is bolded and actually increased in size because this was a lot of what 2020 has been about, being responsive, albeit keeping our five-year strategic areas of focus in mind. On February, you did see us uh, presenting to the St. Lawrence Economic Development Commission corridor, and then we also attended our provincial meetings, uh, Economic Development Council of Ontario Conference, where we hosted or uh, coordinated many meetings with our ministry colleagues it's all important to make sure we maintain those relationships. Things changed on the week of March 9th when co news of COVID-19 was fast and coming fast and furious. Uh, we recognized county's economic development needs to find a way to capture this important information to businesses. And coming forward to March 16th, we established our COVID-19 webpage that focused on relevant business information as both levels of the government we're making announcements daily, hourly, minute to minute. It was a crazy time. Two critical announcements that happened during that time was on March 17th, when Ontario declared the state of emergency, and on March 24th, when they closed all non-essential business. This was significant. At County's Economic Development, we already knew the challenges businesses were facing. And on March 25th, the next day, we had a call with the first business support working group via a conference call because we were not Zoom savvy at that point yet. The purpose of this group was to form stronger ties and open up communication channels uh, with all of us with a focus primarily just supporting our local businesses. As you may recall under the leadership committee and under the leadership and community capacity, we were to evolve the BRE team. Well, with this group, we took it one step further. Next slide. This is, uh, this is the business support working group that was brought together. I mean, everyone came together and you can see all the different entities that are on this slide. Running from left to right, 14 municipalities, the staff from the MP and the MP offices, the Community to Futures Development offices, the small business uh, enterprise, all the Chamber of Commerce came together, the BIAs, the three employment agencies, and the last column is the different ministry representatives to support agencies and uh, education. Some of the key players in bringing this information to us was the Leeds Grenville and Lanark Health Unit and Service Canada. If you recall, things were changing so quickly on the rules and regulations and where people needed to go for help and they were a tremendous resource to all of us in making sure we understood uh, so we could communicate to business. 
everyone rolled up their sleeves and contributed willingly and freely to support businesses in the region. One of the first things this group did was recognize the need to outreach to businesses. On the next slide, a survey was composed quickly and in a collaborative process that was uh, on March 30th, 4,200 businesses were emailed this coming from our business directory, which we had already had in place. So we were able to react quickly. Also promotion happened around the Chamber of Commerces, Commerce and all the different agencies and we couldn't have done it without them. The fact that we had 473 responses 11% rate uh, on that is a testament to the outreach that we did. There was two levels of reports that were completed, one at the county regional level, which helped with our MP and MPP office get information back to the provincial and federal levels, but also to each of our municipalities within Leeds Grenville. The, the survey results confirmed right away the impact of COVID-19 was having on small business. And you can see that the under 20 employees was the highest number of respondents. This aligns closely with our overall size of businesses that we have in this region. In the next slide, the full survey report was available to everyone online, online but I wanted to highlight a couple of items. We asked the question, have you accessed any government support programs currently? Nearly half of our businesses were not aware of what was available. On the next slide. In the survey, we asked, do you want to speak with someone? 175 businesses said yes. Recognizing that we had just completed the BRE survey and we understood that reaching out personally uh, in individual meetings with 300 businesses took a year for a small staff to do, we needed to act quickly. And as time was the essence, it was decided then that the municipal leads would work with other members of the business support working group to reach out to their local community businesses. County's economic development team supported municipalities that were already had their hands full as we have different sized municipalities. And we certainly uh, made sure every business that was contacted in those 175 businesses were thrilled to hear from us. They were thankful of a live voice. They were thankful of an email. They certainly shared their concerns, their fears, and what potential support they could get financially. We helped them with that. On the next slide, we recognize the need though, going forward for an economic recovery strategy. On May 25th, all of the mayors came together, all 13 in Leeds Grenville, and agreed upon, uh, its, um, and agreed upon the need to recognize the importance of recovery, the time it was going to take, and the collaboration it was going to take. You will notice some of these priorities are part of our afternoon sessions that we're going to chat about. Your input, as previous have said, is critical to these. We want to hear from you, and these are the priorities that we have going forward. If we have others, then we will certainly add them. On this slide, the first task team that came together, and uh, we have now uh, dissolved it, but came together on May 26, and this was the biz support for business reopenings. We heard it was easy to close, but reopening all with all the new conditions was a challenge for businesses. The task teams worked with a health unit, local guidelines and resources and documents were pulled together and a video, a list of PPE providers that were local along with signage, businesses needed help and members of the working group uh, business support working group were reaching out to help them with these documents. The development of these resources came from many, but Brockville certainly took a big lead in developing some of the documents and our local and sharing of local policies. If you recall, it was the question of the province has just said we can expand uh, patios, but we had no policies in place to how we do that. And together, municipalities were sharing on how we can support businesses through this, uh, through this period. We were acting critically and we were acting quickly. Once we were comfortable in supporting business reopenings, the small business support task team came in and the transformation was formed. Here is the list, as you can see on this slide, what the goals of the team, again, acknowledge the importance of small businesses in our community. They were the first that we know we had to help. Recognizing the second wave at the time, 
or recognizing the potential second wave. At that time, we didn't know for sure. There is funding available to support small businesses in digital transformation. As a region, we decided to work together, find a way to access as much as the money from digital Main Street possible through digital service squads. We heard businesses needed real help, boots on the ground, not just applying, but boots on the ground to help them with this and help them navigate becoming digital savvy as we move into this next economy. Community leads were established to ensure all 13 municipalities and their small businesses had support. Five applications went in for digital service squads that were submitted in August and successful. On September 23rd, together we received over $127,000 in funds to support the hiring of local people to help our local businesses in digital squads. To connect with the digital squad, the website is listed here, investleadsgrenville.com, Digital Main Street. You may have heard some radio ads. This was, again, a joint campaign that is going on together. The five digital squads and the leads came together to support a campaign throughout all of Leeds Grenville to make sure the message had got out. Here are the lead contacts on this slide uh, for each of those communities. But again, you can find that all on our website, investleadsgrenville.com. Com Digital Main Street. The program is designed to help small businesses with fewer than 10 employees, uh, 10 after ease, or fewer than 25 employees after ease for restaurants or bars. It's not open, unfortunately, to corporate chains and franchise. And I know there's been some discussion about that on uh, for future funding potentials. For small businesses, the digital squad can do the following. Can you see a long list there? But basically we wanna make sure our squad members come out and help you with your digital assessment. They're already doing research on the businesses. Help them with the digital transformation grant. And this is critical. This is $2,500 that can go to businesses and the deadline for submission is November 30th. Our priority is to connect with these eligible businesses first. Hopefully the deadline will be extended but we are trying to get to as many businesses across the region to access this grant money that has been put forward by the provincial and federal governments to uh, leverage as much as we can. After that time frame, our digital stocks will still be available. We're hoping for that digital transformation grant to be extended, but we're waiting on that, uh, that announcement. After uh, November 30th, just going back to that, we will be continuing with our digital squads to support businesses after that. They can help in doing as listed here, um, doing photos, video, helping with uh, social media campaigns. And if you do receive some of that grant money, we also have a local digital vendor list that many of our companies are on. In February, um, sorry, the digital squad will be here till mid-February. So by all means, reach out, connect with your digital squads that are uh, in your area and help our small business become that digital savvy. In the next part also, I just wanna to talk to on, and I know some people have already highlighted this, but uh, some of the uh, items that we have been working on, on pre-COVID and afterwards as well. We again in the region received 500,000 to support Pathways to Production. This is now the second round of funding that has come in a total then of $1 million has come into this region. The Employment and Education Center has the lead on the funding application but the program delivery has been coordinated with St. Lawrence College, CSE Consulting, Keys, and EEC. They've been a great team working together. The program has been another great example of collaboration. The employers currently participating in this uh, is listed here and new to it is 3M and Trillium. If you're a manufacturing employer and want to be interested in this program, certainly reach out to one of your employment agencies or to our office and we'll make sure you get connected to take advantage. There's six cohorts that are going through. We're in two, uh, number two, so four more to go through. And the programs are being run in Gananoque, Brockville and Prescott. Uh, each of those have two sessions. While we've been busy, uh, while we've had business closures and that has been tough to see that happen in our communities, there are some good glimmers of hope there has been new investment occurring in the region, even during this difficult time. 
As noted, uh, there are many people involved in these projects and I'm just bringing the highlights. By no means are we taking credit that this has happened under our watch, but we're glad that others have been able to support. I would like to share a few of those highlights. So for CanArm, you can see there in the top right, that was a $7 million expansion, 60,000 square feet uh, that increased to 12 jobs. And I understand that's going to uh, have more jobs increasing in future. Northern Cables have quietly worked away and they did their announcement of expansion on social media. They're taking two phases in the expansion. They're doing a 6,000 square foot storage area and then followed by an additional 50,000 uh, square foot to their main building. Two of the largest announcements, and I just can't say enough how much this means to our community, and you've heard about them already. The Greenfield expansion, Greenfield Global, 75 million to produce medical grade alcohol, critical to hand sanitizer, and to 3M. And here you can see the photo. This was taken the other day uh, of uh, 70 million to produce those expansion. I'm very proud of the local colleagues and friends that are making this happen. This is creating three, 30 new jobs. In addition, this is in addition to the 425 jobs that are already associated with 3M in Brockville. There are significant developments. So these are significant developments in our region. And as you heard, Minister Fideli, this is a hard work of our MPP and congratulations. And I'm just thrilled that we can uh, have these projects in our community. Congratulations to absolutely everyone from conservation authorities to the municipalities to making these reality and getting them going. With these uh, expansions, we need a workforce. And certainly with this growth, um, Pathways to Production was one example, but there's been two additional announcements that's occurred and we're so fortunate to have that. We do have, and previously we've had a lack of skills trades training in Leeds Grenville. And St. Lawrence College received $774,000 for skills training. 500,000 of that is for mobile learning program, trailer equipped with virtual reality technology. And some of you got to experience that uh, last year uh, doing the virtual reality for the first time. This is for electrical, welding, carpentry, as well as wellness labs. They also received 274,000 for 12 micro credentials in high demand fields such as inventory and fleet optimization, supply chain uh, software, quality assurance, compliance, 3D printing, et cetera. A recent example that I'm just thrilled to see happen was Kempel Campus in North Grenville announced the return of skilled trades to that campus. Is that it was an agricultural college, but certainly skills trades was instrumental. This is a unique opportunity that is occurring in our region with four school boards collaborating under the campus four foundation pillars of education and training, economic development, and health and wellness. This is a great to see, uh, this will be great to see the level one commercial vehicle and equipment Youth Ontario Apprenticeship Program will be happening in September of 2021 under the lead road with the Upper Canada School Board. Congratulations for doing that. Just on a side note though, uh, our first speaker, Dr. Trevin Stat uh, Stratton, Chief Economist with the Canadian Chamber, he was a lead consultant. We were so fortunate to have him on this uh, for both the feasibility and the business plan for the campus. Uh, he then moved on from his consulting capacity into the chamber. And so certainly the talent that he brought to those reports has been amazing. While all of these are great strides going forward, we are continuing to support both large and small businesses going forward and will be critical for that strong local economy and head. And on investleadsgramble.com slash COVID-19, we are continuing to list all the funding that is available. And you can see by this list, it's significant. And this is hard for businesses to navigate. And this is where Trevin, I think Vic also mentioned that uh, locally we need to help our businesses as much as possible. In my office, Jim Hutton, County's Business Development Officer, along with our Economic Development Resource people throughout the region, Dana, Rob, will be looking to help navigate these programs for businesses. Don't hesitate to pick up the phone for businesses and ask us about them. As you can see, uh, this is certainly an uphill challenge. 
and they continue not only to change on what's coming out, but programs can be similar and change the name. So please help our businesses as much as possible on this. I'd like to mention a change that's happening, and I'm not sure if the announcement has fully come through yet. Um, the CF, our local CFDCs, you heard earlier, they were going to relaunch the um, Regional Relief Recovery Fund again, and they're about to make an announcement on the approvals coming through now to the local CFDCs from FedDev. Um, the official announcement could be happening right as I'm standing here. That's how quickly these are, things are happening. But check your local CFDC site to see if the announcement has occurred and the uh, funding is now open again. Uh, for the latest information, you can also check our uh, website investleadsgrenville.com uh, slash COVID-19 and we'll continue to update our web page on those. We'll eventually be mingling those in with our other funding, funding programs as this is becoming the norm of operation. There's absolutely so much happening in the region and the pace is extremely fast. We need to continue being responsive but also strategic. I'd like to encourage everyone to join us for the afternoon chat sessions as the next plan to step forward is, is coming from us, from you, and we need your input on that. Your critical is absolutely paramount. So um, questions, and uh, we did have one come in early. And uh, Joanne, I don't know if there's been any more that's come in. If you're looking to send in a question, by all means, uh, the icon with your hand up, uh, send it through that mechanism and we'll get it in here. The one that did come in was again from Sandra, how are communities of Leeds and Granville already participating in the circular economy? What opportunities and challenges lie ahead? And certainly we've had some of these, whether it be Greenfield Global with Air Liquid uh, and some of our other businesses, uh, is connecting what are their byproducts and uh, seeing how we can connect those business. And communication is absolutely critical on this. And I know uh, Cruz is one of our rail um, transloading facilities located in Johnstown. And just down the road, their neighbor did not know that they were continuing to expand. Uh, so connecting that way, connecting our port with, uh, from a transportation logistics perspective. So businesses working with us, working with other economic development staff, let us know what your byproducts, your supply chain is, and then we can start to uh, marry up what that circular economy. The shorter the supply chain, the better for our local businesses. Sandra, I hope that gives you a little thought on uh, the circular economy. And certainly I know your very most, most uh, uh, precious area is the uh, bio economy, and this is of tremendous uh, value to the region and we'll continue to see where we can make those opportunities happen. Joe, was there any more questions that came in? Okay, so without further ado then, I think we'll go to, we we'll get to go to lunch a little bit early. So that's not a bad thing because today I'm not waiting on the caterer. Hopefully you've been on the phone and called your local restaurants. But before we go to lunch, we have a lunch uh, uh, gift certificate opportunity, $25 to a restaurant of your choice. And you know, we've made this uh, choice to support our restaurants strategically. It's important we get people going to our local restaurants and continue them providing that great service that they do. Under the Q&A section, again, the first person to be the closest to, or if you need to guess, the number of businesses in the Leeds Granville Business Directory. Submit your answer through the Q&A and I'll give you a hint. You can find that answer at digital, or excuse me, at directory.leedsgranville.com. So good luck with that. Uh, while you are there, uh, update your business listing if you're already on our directory, but if you're a new business, certainly take time to register and we'll gladly add you as long as you're within the Leeds Grenville boundaries. Um, also, if you're not receiving our e-newsletter, uh, that comes out every two weeks, a fabulous e-newsletter. It has funding information that comes in uh, and we uh, profile our businesses. If you're interested in being profiled, let us know. Deanna Clark comes out and meets with you. And finally, I just want to encourage everyone again to participate in our chat room session this afternoon. 
One, it's a great place to network. This is the challenge today is I can't see all of you, but in the chat rooms, you can. And so I hope everyone can come, put their, give their input, see some friends, do the virtual handshake, test their mute and unmute button because that's always been the, the big laugh of you're muted, you're muted. So uh, you'll be able to unmute and get in, engaged in the conversation. So I wish everyone enjoy your lunch and we'll be back uh, at one o'clock and we'll go over how to get into those chat rooms through the three icons uh, and we'll get that promptly started at one o'clock. Thanks, enjoy your Leeds Granville lunch.